Chapter 79, Interlude Part 1, Settling In Yuzumaki Residence This past week has revealed a lot of things, most of them outright disastrous, and Katori doesn't know how to process it all. She's currently trying using one of the methods that's worked for her so far. Training. Well, it started off as training. Right now she's in their backyard's small training area, where a few targets for shuriken and kunai practice and training dummies for taijutsu practice are strewn about. Her current target, however, is a tree that she's violently brushing with a soft condor feather. She swings as if she's holding a sword and cleaving through it, despite not doing anything to it. The targets around her all have feathers stuck to them, but most of them hit the sides, and none of them have landed dead center. She just can't focus right now. Her mind keeps flashing to what happened in the hidden dream village. She thinks about the power he displayed. She thinks about the large phoenix that blocked the horizon, about the massive feathers he summoned that put even the ostrich to shame, about his ability to fly. So that's what the Hoyoku clan is capable of. Compared to that, she looks like she isn't doing anything. She thinks about how he spoke about her parents. How non-caring he was, how he's the reason she was all alone for all those years. She thinks about Makin so much, she doesn't even notice she's not hitting the tree with the feathers, but with her fists. She punches the tree's tough exterior to the point that her knuckles are bleeding, but she doesn't feel a thing, her mind's too preoccupied to even care. It's only when a gentle pair of hands grab her fist and stop her that she snaps out of her trance. Hinata wraps her arms around Katori from behind and rests her head on the girl's shoulder. It's all right, Katori. Hinata says softly. It's all right. Katori allows her body to go limp and leans back into Hinata's embrace. He grabs Hinata's arms as if they're her lifeline, and she allows herself to let her guard down. She leans back on her mom's chest and takes a minute to quietly sob. Hinata simply stays silent the entire time and allows Katori to get the weight off. After taking a moment to let everything off her chest, they stay like that for a while longer, until Katori finally regains her full senses and realizes her hands have been hurting the entire time. Ow. She winces and starts rubbing her wounds. Hinata stops her. Don't, you'll only make it worse. Wait just a minute. She stands up and goes into the house. Some moments later, she walks back out with a first aid kit. She rubs the wounds with a special ointment of her own making. It takes effect nearly instantly, Katori can already feel it working and easing her burning sensation. Once the ointment settles on the skin, Hinata wraps her hands in bandages. There, good as new. Thanks. Katori sniffs and wipes her nose with her sleeve. You know you can talk to us, right? You tried keeping your feelings back even in the hidden cloud. Hinata reminds her of the heart-to-heart -heart they had in the cloud's hospital. You don't need to put so much stress on yourself. We're here for you. There's nothing to talk about. Katori looks down. If there's something to cry about, there's definitely something to talk about. Hinata brushes Katori's hair in comfort. Yezu told us what happened, told us about Makan. I can't even begin to imagine what that must have been like and what you're going through right now. But you can lean on us or on Shoto and Yakamaru. You haven't trained with them in a week. Katori wraps her arms around her knees. I kinda said something insensitive to Yakamaru. I think he hates me now. Hinata chuckles. I don't think Yakamaru can hate. Most of all not you. If you've said something then shouldn't you try to make it up to him? Is this related to what's got you so stressed, Kinda? Yeah. Katori nods. Then you should at least clean the air with them, no? I know your bonds are stronger than this. She's right. Naruto's voice comes from the house. Katori looks up to see him coming closer. In a certain way, she dreaded him finding out. He was the one person she didn't want to worry, the one person she didn't want to doubt her. Yet she allowed herself to break. Naruto walks up to her and kneels down to place a hand on her head. I'm sorry. I thought giving you space to think things through would be best, but I kinda ended up making it worse, huh? Katori looks up to him with a stunned expression before quickly burying her head in her knees. Did. He know? Guess I'm not as good at hiding it as I thought I was. Naruto sits by her side and takes a moment to gather his thoughts before finally speaking up. You know, I used to wonder a lot, too, so I know that look on your face all too well. Katori turns her head and looks up to him. Wonder about what? What kind of people my parents were, why they're no longer around. What my life would be like if they were here. He looks at her with a somber smile. Kept me up more nights than I'll admit. So how did you move on? Honestly? I didn't. Naruto shrugs. But I did find people to fill that void, and eventually I was even able to meet mom and dad, found out who they were and what they were like. 
then I think I was able to appreciate everyone around me even more, made me realize I wasn't missing as much as I thought. Iruka sensei and Shizune acting as my parents at my wedding is one of my fondest memories, and I know mom and dad would like them. He flashes his bright grin. Katori can't help but feel a pang of guilt for thinking the way she did and doubting them after everything they'd done for her, everything they taught her and all the love they've given her. Naruto pats her on the head and pulls her to his side. Whenever you want to talk, I'm here. As a dad or a fellow orphan, I'll listen. Katori leans into his hugs and wraps one arm around him and one arm around Hinata. Thank you. Mom, Dad. She squeezes them both as tightly as she can before jumping up to her feet and wiping her eyes. I need to go find Yoku and Shoto. They're training at Shoto's today. You can probably catch them. Naruto smiles. Katori grins and runs off to find them. Naruto and Hinata both look off into the direction Katori ran to, even long after she disappears from sight. She's taking on a lot and trying to cope on her own. Hinata finally says after a few moments of silence. Yeah, Naruto nods. She's still going through a lot, even now. Especially now. Then we have to be extra careful to be here for her. We will. Naruto wraps an arm around her waist and rests his head on her shoulder. Hinata leans to the side and rests her head on top of his own, taking in the moment. Hakage's office. Yezu sits in front of the desks and stares at a hidden leaf forehead protector with an intensity that could kill. The room awaits him to speak with bated breath, the room being only Tsunade, Shizune, and Tantan. Yezu reaches for the forehead protector as Tsunade leans forward in her seat in anticipation. He pushes it back to her. I can't accept it. He sighs and leans back in his chair. Tsunade does the same. Well, that's a shame. We could really use you among our ranks. Yezu chuckles. If you need a fossil like me, you must be in big trouble. He settles down and shakes his head. That fight with Makin took everything I had left. I'm old and out of shape. I think I'll stick to just training the new Yuzumaki. I understand. Still, I had to make the offer. It's not everyday people from our generation enter our lives, rather than leave them. I, I'll drink to that. Sonata's hand almost instinctively reaches for her special drawer. Well, if you insee. Shizuna clears her throat and glares at her mentor. Lady Tsunade, she says in a scolding voice. Fine, Tsunade rolls her eyes. Yezu bursts into laughter. Little one's got you under control, huh, like you wouldn't believe. Tsunade rests her chin in her palm, elbow on her armrest. Shizuna blushes and looks away, embarrassed from being put in the spotlight like that. Aye, it's nothing like that. So, the Thunder Lion's days are over, huh, going to pass your knowledge to the next batch that and taking care of my family when i heard about kashina's death i gave up and turned back if i hadn't i might have found out about naruto and been here or him so the least i could do is be here for katori and hiroto make sure they get all the love they can shizuna smiles i'm sure they already feel it i sure hope so i can't wait to see what kind of shinobi they'll become yuzumaki clan district naruto Walking down the streets of the clan district, he snaps his head in the direction of his overly loud and overly infuriated cousin, although according to her, her fury is at just the right level. Karen Power walks right into Naruto's personal space, aggressively pointing a finger at him as he holds his hands up in a defensive position. Uh, hi, can I help you with something? He asks with caution. You know exactly what, mister. She somehow finds a way to get even more up in his business. It's about that insane. You're going to take over the Yuzumaki clan idea you have in that empty head of yours. You've been avoiding me for weeks and. She's interrupted by Naruto placing a hand on her shoulder. He gives her his usual warm and calming smile. Karen, before you say anything else. And with that, Naruto disappears in a puff of smoke. Karen stares blankly at the space previously occupied by what seems to have been a shadow clone. Her blood comes to a boiling point and she can't hold the trembling of her whole body. She throws her bag to the floor with as much force as she can muster, not paying any attention to the people on the street staring at her. That's how you want to play it, cousin? Fine. She brings her hands together and sends out her chakra over a white area to sense the position of every single person. Mind's eye of the Kagura. There are 12 Naruto's in her range, and she's going to go through all of them. Teshin Clan's Hidden Leaf Dojo as Katori nears the entrance of the dojo, she can already hear the grunting of trainees and hitting of hardwood floor coming from inside. As always, they're hard at work. She slides the front panels open and takes a peek inside. About a dozen or so people are training, some of them probably ninja, 
but neither Yakamaru nor Shoto were among them. Oh, hello Katori. Asami Teshin grabbed her attention from the other side of the room, from where she observes the trainees. Hi Auntie Asami. Katori waves before fully stepping in and carefully closing the door behind her. How are you? I'm very well, thank you for asking. Asami smiles. I assume you're looking for Shoto and Yakamaru? Katori nods slowly. I am. They're out back, training their ninjutsu. Asami motions to the doorway that leads further in, not a door that leads directly out, but it does lead to the way out, a path Katori is familiar with. It's good to see you around here again, it's been a while. Katori rubs the back of her neck in embarrassment. Ah, yeah, just. Been dealing with family stuff. So I heard. Asami says in excitement. Katori freezes. She has? Did they tell her? Naruto's long-lost uncle appeared, didn't he? I'm so happy to hear they've found each other. Asami smiles. Oh, that? She sighs in relief. Yeah, it's been something. A lot of stuff to get used to. We should have dinner someday. All of the Team 9 families. That'd be nice. Katori smiles. Oh, but I shouldn't keep you waiting. Go find the boys. Asami ushers her to go. It was nice seeing you. Katori waves as she heads of the door. You, too, dear. Katori quickly makes her way to the back of the building, passing by older styles, corridors not too dissimilar to what the houses the Hyuga clan have, or some of the older lead clans. Each door that leads to other rooms is finely decorated with paintings of great beasts, from fictional dragons to real dire tigers, being displayed in their full majesty. When she reaches one of the doors leading outside, distinguished by the translucent paper panels that allow in sunlight, she takes a moment to pause and take a deep breath. Even from here, she can hear the sounds of earth moving and cracking, or glass or something glass-like breaking. Clearly they're working hard. Katori steps outside and does indeed see her teammates training their ninjutsu. Yakamaru is placing defensive wall after defensive wall and cheering on Shoto, who's breaking them with hardened stone punches, although each consecutive strike does less damage and takes more force to break through. It's not certain if that's a sign of Shoto getting tired or Yakamaru strengthening the walls. From their peripheral, they both see Katori step down from the wooden boards and onto the earthen yard and slowly approach. Shoto steps back and crosses his arms while Yakamaru steps forward instead. You came. Yakamaru shyly looks down. I have something I should have said a while ago. Yeah, me, too, actually. They both bow deeply at the other. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They apologize in unison. Katori looks up in confusion. Huh? What are you apologizing for? Well, it's just. I got too emotional. You were going through things and I just. Made it about me and losing dad. Were you apologizing? Because. Katori's confusion returns back to being flustered and embarrassed. She drags her foot on the ground, drawing circles with it. I said a whole bunch of stuff as if I'm the only one who's gone through pain and stuff. I made your loss seem smaller compared to mine and so. I'm sorry. Is. Is that why you haven't been around? Yakamaru furrows his brow. Yeah, why did you think? I figured you were angry with me. I didn't know how to apologize so I. Stayed away for a week. You dummy. Kodoi walks over and gently bonks him on the head. I was the one being moody. A smile finds its way on Yakamaru. I'm glad. I didn't like not seeing you for a week. Katori grins and pulls him into a tight hug. I missed you, too, Yoku. Shoto walks over to them. Well that was resolved disappointingly fast. Do you want us to argue? Katori pouts. Sometimes you just have to talk about it. Yakamaru says. Like you're one to talk. Shoto scoffs. Remember when you ran off because your mom started dating again? Yakamaru's cheeks flush with embarrassment. That was. A long time ago. Shoto, I owe you an. Shoto interrupts her by quickly jumping forward and striking with a fist, stopping just before he strikes her. If you want to apologize, then show me you've been doing something other than sulk for a whole week. Katori grins. You got it. She immediately jumps up and kicks Shoto's arm away, kicking several more times mid-air to get him to back off. It works. Shoto slides back and takes a fighting stance as Katori herself needs her chakra with the bird sign. Feather kunai barrage. Dozens of feathers materialize around her and fly at Shoto. He dodges and weaves between them until he's forced to take on a more direct approach. Earth style? Earth spear. His hands darken as the ninjutsu hardens his body to allow him to directly punch away at the feathers flying at him. When he finally strikes the final one down, he looks for Katori to find her. Nowhere. However, a shadow on the ground that shouldn't be there reveals where she is. Shoto looks up to see Katori falling right at him. Here I go. She calls out and conjures two large condor feathers in her hands. 
She grabs them by the quills and winds her arms back. Feather blade. That's, that Makangai's jutsu? Shoto focuses even more of his chakra into his arms to heighten the effect of his earth spear. As Katori swings her feathers down, Shoto raises his arms in defense only to feel nothing. The feathers gently brush against his forearms as if they were, well, feathers. Katori lands on the ground with a flourish, while Shoto looks on with confusion. He double-checks his arms to make sure it's not some kind of delayed damage or something, but no, the feathers were just soft. What was that suppose? Katori interrupts him by kicking him in the stomach. Shoto clenches his belly in pain and heaves. You sucker punching. You didn't say to stop. Katori defends herself. Yeah, sure, make it my fault. He rubs his stomach to ease the pain. Yakamaru approaches them, having stepped back in anticipation of their spar which seems has ended abruptly. Your feathers. You tried to use them as a sword? Katori nods and looks down at her feather knot blades. You guys saw what that guy can do. He could conjure feathers as big as us and control birds as big as dad when he and Karama fight. He could even fly. She looks to Shoto with a pained smile to try and hide the bad feelings, even just thinking about Makin are bringing her. I told you I could fly. Yeah, you did. Shoto smiles back, seeing her attempts to keep a brave face. I have to defeat him. She clutches her feathers. I need to. And we will. Yakamaru places a hand over her fist. Together. No more pouting for a week this time. Shoto states. Katori puffs out her cheeks. You're gonna keep bringing this up, aren't you? Until I see a reason not to. He smirks. Come on, let's train. Yeah. Yuzumaki clan heads office. Naruto's schedule lately has been somewhat mixed. He's had to do plenty of missions with Team 9, which means not always having time to catch up on important clan business, although it was easy to do with D-rank missions, since a shadow clone could easily do the job. Right now he's catching up on what he missed while dealing with the whole Hidden Dream Village debacle. He and Elder Awaji are pouring through documents and reports of mainly two things. One is evidence and rumors of more members of the Uzumaki clan or really anyone from the former hidden whirlpool village, and the other one locating lost artifacts and relics of the village that could do well to come back home. There sure is a lot. Naruto scratches his head. Indeed there is. Awaji takes off his reading glasses and leans back to rest his old eyes. Our village was rich in many ways, and many wanted those riches. From the smallest bauble to our grandest jutsu. A lot of them are dead ends, though. Most of this stuff just up and vanished in the middle of the Third Great Ninja War. I'm afraid such are the risks of war. There are many who use the commotion to steal valuables. Many of ours just happen to be lost in the mix. Can we even find them like this? Naruto sets aside the scroll he was reading and opens up a book on his other side. Like, there's some things here that look like they might be, but I don't think they are. Are we gonna have to look into these ones, too, to make sure they're not the items we're looking for? If we wish to be thorough, yes. Awaji nods. Great. Naruto sighs. At this point, his mind drifts to how this whole process lacks any sort of excitement. Pouring through books was never something he excelled at, but in this case there's no alternative of punching through it. His wish for excitement, however, would be somewhat answered. Karen kicks the door and stomps in. I swear this better be your aisle. Oh, hey Karen. Naruto looks up to her with a bright and innocent smile. It only took you six clones to get to me. Nice work. Oh, don't you patronize me. Awaji adjusts his glasses back to his nose. Is something the matter Karen? You know exactly what the matter is, old man. Ah, the matter of you becoming the next clan head. Of course. Awaji recalls. I do remember you being quite cross about that. Of course I am. You can't just decide for me. Karen. Naruto says in an oddly calm voice as he stands up and walks around his desk. Why are you even so against it? Because. I don't want to lead shit. But you kinda are, aren't you? You've been helping me so much. I have no idea how I'd even do any of this without you. And when I'm away on missions with Team 9, you're the one picking up my slack. That? That's different. I'm just helping you, I'm not doing it full time. Naruto shrugs. Still, you do an amazing job when the clan likes you. You keep everyone focused and I know you'll be able to keep them moving forward. Besides, Gramps is here to help too. For as long as I manage to keep standing, that is, Awaji laughs. It's, ugh. Karen shakes her head to try and get her thoughts in order. Look, the last person who put me in charge of anything was Arachimaru. I have experience in putting maniacs and psychopaths in their place, that's it. These past years have shown you much more capable than just that. Awaji says. 
Look, Naruto walks and places a hand on her shoulder. All this is far in the future, anyway. Granny Tsunade is still young. She's not that old so she won't be retiring anytime soon. When she does and if she picks me as the sixth, it'll be years from now. If you still feel the same, then that's it. Someone else will take over. But right now you're the one I trust the most to do this. You might think you're not fit for it, but I see you for who you are is pretty damn awesome. Karen looks away from his far too calming gaze, trying to use her hair to hide her flushed cheeks. As if saying something so corny's gonna work. Naruto grins and pulls her into a hug. You just gotta see the person I see. She's pretty cool. Karen smiles and for only a brief moment returns the hug before pushing him away with a smile. All right, before I catch any more of your sappiness. Will you think about it? Naruto asks one final time. Karen sighs and shakes her head. Yeah, sure, I'll think about it. Then shall we get back to work in that case? Awaji pulls back the scrolls he was working on in front of him. There are still many lost. What are you looking for? Karen asks. The same as before. Several of the Yuzumaki who I lost track of years ago. The best case scenario was that they simply went deeper into hiding. The worst case scenario. That someone found them. But with everything that's happened. Naruto walks back behind his desk, they were probably recruited. The guys we fought back at the hidden whirlpool were Yuzumaki, and they're the ones behind everything that's been happening. Find them and we find the great beasts, yeah. We've had zero luck in three years, though. Karen says. Doesn't mean we should stop. We've been a step behind this whole time and we can't let that go on. All right, give me a scroll. Karen goes to her own desk besides Naruto's. Maybe we'll find something new this time. Yuzumaki Household In the evening, Katori comes back home utterly exhausted and filthy but happy nonetheless, after a day of training with her teammates. It's managed to lift a heavy weight off her shoulders. Constantly thinking of Makan and her birth parents hasn't exactly been productive or good for her state of mind. If she's going to get answers, she needs to get serious about her training. Well, tomorrow. Right now she doesn't have the strength to do much of anything, so it's going to be bath, dinner, and sleep. Maybe in that order or maybe not. When she opens the front door, the aroma of a freshly cooked meal immediately hits her, and she almost forgets about how tired she is. I'm home. She calls out as she takes off her shoes, placing them by the entryway. She notes the shoes that have been thrown in a disorderly fashion, most likely Naruto's, and fixes them. She also notes a somewhat larger pair besides his and Hinata's. Welcome home. Hinata calls out from the kitchen. Katori runs up to peek inside to see Hinata behind the stove and Naruto setting up the table. Hey. Naruto grins. How'd it go? Good. We. Talked. Hinata giggles. And a bit more from the looks of it. She looks over Katori's muddy clothes. Go take a bath. You can tell us how it went over dinner. Will do. Katori salutes and spins around to make her way to the bathroom. As she does, she hears heavy footsteps coming from the second to the first floor. Hiroto's nice and asleep now. Let's see if he stays that way. Yezu calls out as he makes his way down, taking the turn in the stairs, and waves to Katori. Hey, kid. Oh, Uncle Yezu. I was. Hoping to talk to you. Katori hesitates for a moment, having braced herself to ask tomorrow and not this very evening. You. For it Makan. You got a close look of his abilities, right? Yezu raises a brow. Yeah, I did. Naruto and Hinata halt what they were doing, both curious and worried about their daughter and whatever she wants to ask. Do you. Think you could help me do what he did? Master my jutsu. Naruto gives her a sympathetic look. Katori. Yezu looks into the kitchen to see if there's any disapproval from the parents and seeing none, turns back to Katori. I, I probably could. I don't know exactly what your jutsu's capable of, but if you already got a good grasp, we can probably emulate it. What spurred this one? It's just. Katori closes her eyes and takes a deep breath before opening them and looking up to Yezu. Makan knew me. He knew who I was, where I came from. If. If I'm going to get answers, it's going to be from him. I need to get strong to fight him. I need to get to his level. Right. Yezu nods. I see. Naruto walks up to her and kneels by her side, placing a hand on her shoulder. This isn't gonna be easy, you know. I know. Katori states. But this isn't something I can run away from. I have to face it head on. Hinata steps outside, as well, brushing her hands off a towel. Whatever you decide, we're here for you. Yeah. Naruto nods. We'll be right by your side when you find out about your past. He pulls Katori into a hug. She leans into it and hugs back, as Hinata wraps her arms around both. 
Yezu smiles at the family's support for each other. I'm scared. Katori says in a quiet voice. That's fine. Naruto rubs her back. We'll get past that together, too. End of Chapter 79 Chapter 80 Interlude Part 2 Grand Discoveries Hidden Leaf Village Conference Room With the advent of peace and cooperation, there have been several advancements already. The first major one was enhancing the Hidden Rain's pods, with the Hidden Leaf's advanced medical knowledge, to create a more efficient and portal method of reliable healing, although their clunkiness is still something that needs to be worked out. Storage scrolls are very handy, but even they can barely handle more than one or two pods. They were never meant to store such large objects. The next big advancement would be the ease of communication. Once again utilizing the Hidden Rain top engineers, with a lot of aid from the Hidden Cloud, long-distance conferences are now much simpler and require much less electricity than before. It was always reserved for emergencies because of how unstable it was, typically between the Hakage and the Daimyo, but now it's easier than ever to connect to the leaders of the foreign lands. Sonata sits at a special desk, connected to more wiring than any other place in the leaf could possibly need. Behind her, as always, is her most trusted aide, Shizune Yumino, with Kakashi Hataka and Shikamaru Nara standing to the side to listen in. In front of the desk is a video camera, a device that bears resemblance to a bulkier-than-average photo camera, easily bigger than Sonata's head. Surrounding the camera are a total of 11 large television sets, ordered in a two-layer semicircle. Each TV is marked with the symbol of a hidden village. The top six TVs belong to the sand, cloud, stone, mist, rain, and waterfall, while just under them are the ones marked for frost, mountain, star, dream, moon. Sonata waits patiently as her team ensures everything is connected correctly. They've run tests before, of course, and while the technology has improved, it's still not perfect. On top of everything, there are two additional signals that weren't present during the last tests. After several minutes, the team gives Sonata the sign that all's clear. On her signal, they activate the camera, and all the TVs switch on where the other village leaders appear. The team stays behind for a moment longer to fix any remaining static before taking their leave. A clears his throat. To start things off, I'd like to welcome Tsukino of the Hidden Moon and Enzo Tenro of the Hidden Dream. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Enzo bows his head. We owe our lives to the Hidden Leaf, after all. It'd be unbecoming to not repay that as best we can. Tsukiyo bows her head, as well. Likewise, we would most likely not be standing if it weren't for the Shinobi Union's cause. I don't see any others, though. Sonata notes. Are the Hidden Moon and Dream the only new members? Gara nods. The Hidden Valley Village decided to remain neutral at this time. Anoki crosses his arms. The Hidden Rock Village, as well. They held on to the fear that as a smaller village, their wants would be pushed aside in favor of our own. I'd like to call them paranoid, but. That'd be a bit hypocritical, wouldn't it? A chuckles. I regret to say that the Hidden Lock Village has also declined our invitation. As has the Natashiko Village. Meiterum Plus chimes in. Although they have always separated themselves from our matters. It was a long shot, but we at least tried. She shrugs. Enzo leans back in his chair. We were the same, but it seems that was not in the cards for us. We were shown that isolating ourselves made us vulnerable to manipulation. I imagine they're all observing us closely. Conan says. They're not yet certain what the Shinobi Union plans and wish to see how we'll proceed. Sonata nods. Most likely. Truthfully, Tsukino speaks up. I don't know if the Hidden Moon Village would have joined, were it not for the extraneous circumstances we found ourselves in. That seems to be the case for everyone. Anoki sighs. Honestly I'm surprised we managed to reach 12 members. Perhaps, Gara says. But we found like-minded people who wish to see positive change as we do. There may be those who still doubt, but as long as we continue the good work we've been doing, the others will come in time. Before we do any of that, he raises his voice to signal a shift in conversation, transitioning to the more serious subjects at hand, we still have quite the serious problem to solve. One we've not gotten any closer to solving. The Great Beasts and the Uzumaki Clan. Kaitamaru Sakata says. Precisely. A nods. Enzo Tenro of the Hidden Dream Village, your former village had unleashed a great beast, one that was under the protection of your clan. We'd like to hear anything you have to say on the matter. Enzo sighs and shakes his head. I'm afraid I don't have much to say. To begin with, I myself was not aware of the contents of the seal. It had been a long time since that knowledge was lost. We just knew it was powerful, powerful enough to stand up to any threat we may face. And yet Jensui Amajiri knew. 
Kaitamaru says. Could he have been working with this Yuzumaki faction? Did they get in contact with him? Of course, Kaitamaru knows the answer to these questions. He's well aware that neither he nor any of his people have ever spoken to Gensui Amajiri. He's genuinely curious how the presence of a great beast slipped past him. That's a possibility, Anoki says. They've been oddly quiet until this incident. For that, I'm afraid I can't say. Enzo answers. Genui and Makin had us all fooled. Frankly, I wasn't even aware that Yezu is a member of the Uzumaki clan. Kaitamaru crosses his arms and attempts to steer his allies away from the truth. I think it'd be best to operate under the assumption that Gensui was working with her for this faction of the Uzumaki. The last time they did anything was when they attacked our hack in town to try and steal the Sharingan we'd collected. I agree. Mei chimes in. Have you had any troubles, Hakage? Sonata shakes her head. Since we took possession of the Sharingan, there have been no attempts to steal them. Shibuki of the Hidden Waterfall scratches his chin. Sounds like they're too scared to try and attack the Hidden Leaf. They've proven to be bold before. A growls. They attacked the Hidden Cloud with that lightning monster, Nu. And it was repelled back with relative ease, if memory serves. Gara says. Their strength may still be limited. Yet we find ourselves lagging behind. Sonata pinches her brow in mild frustration. We still don't know their plans, their goals. Nothing. It's like they just don't exist. About that. Ace says. What of your Yuzumaki clan, Hakage? They've been on a hunt of their own, have they not? I'm afraid that hunt is still in its beginning stages. Elder Awaji believes some of the Yuzumaki he once lost track of either joined this rogue faction or founded it. He and Naruto and tracing their steps to hopefully find where they went. Kaitamaru silently chuckles to himself. Good luck with that. Have them keep at it. Even the smallest hint could be a game changer. Don't worry, they've got this covered. Sonata turns to look at the Hidden Moon's monitor. That leaves us with what happened in the Hidden Moon. Ah, yes. Tsukino jolts up, having been focusing on the conversation at hand to gleam any further insight. Not one, but possibly two trees that bear a connection to the divine tree that nearly destroyed the world. Anoki scratches his chin. That's quite the secret to keep. Yes, I realize that. However, both have been destroyed. Tsukino says. For better or worse. Do we suspect any involvement from the Yuzumaki clan? Mei asks. Unlikely. Anoki answers. Shingo was never the kind to work for anyone other than himself. We also had our analysis team scan his mind, and they found nothing. Sonata says. Is there any way to restore your sacred tree to life? A asks. If we could have an asset like that on our side. Tsukino shakes her head. I'm afraid it does not look like a possibility. The Hidden Leafs Yamato attempted to use his wood style, but it wasn't effective. Either way, this does appear to be an isolated incident. We're sorry for the losses you've suffered, both of you. Thank you. Enzo and Tsukino both bow their heads. For now, we must continue our search for further evidence. Sonata states, Our Anbu have this as their top priority. I realize this is quite a lot to throw the hidden dream and hidden moon into. Enzo shakes his head. No, if these people tried to further their goals by destroying my village, then we will aid the Shinobi Union in any way we can. And it's time for the hidden moon to stop being neutral when faced with such adversity. A smiles. Very well. Then let's move on to more pleasant topics. With that, the meeting shifts from talking about the greater threat posed by the great beasts and the sect of the Uzumaki clan, to catching up Enzo Tenro and Tsukino on what would be expected of their villages going forward and how they would interact with the other members of the union. It takes a solid two hours, and Sonata is happy when it ends so she can stretch her body. Sitting in one place for so long isn't good for the old bones. With the cameras and monitors all turned off, Kakashi steps forward along with Shikamaru. You didn't tell them about Sasuke's mission. No, I didn't. She looks back at Kakashi with a pointed stare. And we'll keep it that way for now. Is it really wise to keep secrets from our own allies? Shizune asks. Oh, I'm sure Rikage and Tsuchikage will be furious. If I'm correct in keeping it a secret, I'll handle the blowout. If I'm not, then it's just something we wasted our time on. Shizuna keeps the worried expression she oh so often has when talking to Tsunade. If you say so. We do still have our doubts about certain people. Kakashi says. We may be at peace, but it's evident not everyone wishes for it. I just hope it turns out well. Shizuna clutches her clipboard close to her chest. For all out sakes. It's fine. Tsunade reassures her. We have our best in the field. Hidden Mountain Village as soon as the meeting ends, Kaitamaru Yuzumaki heads out of the conference room, 
followed by his most trusted companion, Kuga Nekamata, her partner Setsu in the White Tigress, and Mizushi Asui. Could they be getting close? Kuga asks. They certainly think they are. Even if they do get closer, they won't have the time to do anything. The five great villages are resourceful, they may find a way. Mizushi advises caution. Kaitamaru chuckles. The only thing great about them is their hypocrisy. They've been running in circles for years, and soon we'll show the world how great they actually are. It will be a sweet victory for the smaller villages. When they reach the corner, one person flickers right next to them, dressed in the traditional hidden mountain Zanbu garb with an angry Oni mask. We've found them, sir. Takeshi Amori reports. The five tails has settled in an area just outside the land of Earth, and the three tails has been spotted around the smaller islands in the northern parts of the land of water. Excellent. Kaitamaru laughs. Then we've as good as one. Takeshi, Kuga, you two will take your team to the five tails. Mizushi, we're going to the three tails. There's one more thing. Takeshi interrupts the planning. We've found him, as well. He and his men are hiding in a small village in the land of hot waters. Oh? A smile creeps across Kaitamaru's face. Then it'd be rude not to say hello. Change of plans, Mizushi, go to the three tails but await my arrival. If we're lucky, I'll be there with a new friend. If not, I'll be there after eliminating a threat. Mizushi nods. Yes, sir. I hope I don't need to tell you this, but when you act you best have planned out every breath you're going to take. The last thing we need is Naruto Uzumaki being warned. Yes, sir. The three of them say in unison and scatter to prepare. Just one more step and we'll win. We won't have to hide in the shadows like we've. Gah. Kaitamaru falls to one knee, his face twisted in pain. Kaitamaru? Mizushi grabs him by the shoulder to keep him on his feet. What happened? Kuga asks. Kaitamaru growls as he holds his hand over his eye to try and ease the piercing sensation he feels. When he removes his hand, the Sharingan, which is normally kept hidden away by Fuinjutsu, is fully revealed from its seal. Kaitamaru looks down at the blood on his hand. Opposite to what one would expect of someone in this situation, Kaitamaru laughs. It seems a other battle is being fought, as well. While we fight in the land of the living, another battle rages beyond the Rashomon. All the more reason for us to hurry. Kaitamaru grins, his almost too giddy expression enough to put anyone off, and clasps Mizushi by the shoulder. We're close. We're finally so close. Somewhere far from the land of fire. Chazing rumors from hundreds of years ago isn't always the most exciting or fruitful. It more often than not leads you to spending days and weeks, uncertain if you're just not finding what you're looking for, or if there's nothing to be found in the first place. For a couple of months now, Sasuke Achiha has been assigned to chase rumors, which was interrupted by the occasional transporting people to and from foreign villages, so he hasn't made significant progress. At least now he's free to focus. This particular rumor has sent him a fair bit away from home, a journey that would usually take weeks, but thanks to his unique skill set, it took all of five seconds. This particular journey has led him to an ancient long-forgotten temple built into the cliffside. It lay buried under rubble for who knows how long until he found it. What once was probably a beautifully decorated building is now decrepit after being left to the passage of time. The stone furniture has mostly held, but its contents have not fared as well. What books and scrolls have survived are barely readable while the others had worn out long ago. Stone steps on the sides of the room lead up to a higher floor, where a balcony is carved into the interior. Like a tower, the structure goes up high, having at least five levels to it that he can see. As Sasuke stands in front of one of the numerous bookcases, he runs his fingers across the book covers, trying to identify which ones may survive closer inspection. The woman silently walks toward him, not making a noise despite the stone floor, making it easy for someone to make noise. She's dressed in the standard Anbu uniform, her only distinguishing features being her cat mask and blonde hair kept in place by six thick needles. Find anything? He asks her without even having turned to notice her presence. She shakes her head. The others are clear. Valuable historical texts, but nothing that helps us directly. So this one's the only one we haven't checked. Allow me. She steps closer to the bookcase and focuses her chakra. By Akugin, hidden by her mask, veins around her eyes bulge out as she scans through the ancient texts. Hyper-focusing on such minor details can be daunting, as it's no simple task to look between the pages of a closed book. The concentration required is probably one of the most challenging aspects of training the Byakugan, but she's mastered it to a needlepoint. It takes several minutes with Sasuke helping by physically going through the more intact books, but in the end they find no information of worth. Nothing? She shakes her head. 
Sasuke rolls up the scroll he'd been reading and places it back on its shelf. Hopefully the others are having more luck. Sasuke, Kamachi. The voice calls out to them from one of the higher levels. Two more Anbu flicker down to their level, a man with gray hair tied into a side ponytail, and a man with short dark hair and multiple smaller scrolls and painting brushes strapped to his waist. Have you had any luck? Sai asks. Sasuke shakes his head. No. You? Possibly. Toa? Sai looks back to the man with him and extends an open hand. Toa carefully hands him a worn-out scroll, which Sai places on a stone table and unfurls. Its condition is surprisingly enough not as severe as the rest, although much of its writing is still worn out and intelligible. It looks fresher than the others. Sasuke notes. Was it placed here some time after them? Toa shakes his head. I don't think so. This paper is different, made from a now extinct tree that used to grow in the land of wind. It was extraordinarily expensive and reserved for the most important matters. You seem to know a lot about the matter. Sasuke says. I dabble. Toa says. Toa is an expert on all things concerning scribing. There's a reason I brought him and Kamachi on this mission. Sai says. So if this scroll is more important than the rest, what does it say? Sasuke asks. Well, that's the thing. Sai runs his finger across the faded out writing. It's random scribblings. If it's a code, it's unlike any I've ever encountered. Do we have a reason to believe it to be of worth to us? Kamachi asks as she examines the writing. We do. Toa nods and takes out a much smaller scroll and one brand new one. He lays them out on the table. The older scroll obviously has been worn out with some writing just barely readable, while the fresh scroll seems to have the same exact writing. I was able to use my ink to restore the writing. It's not in code. Sai says. I think the message is one you'll find a particular interest in. Sasuke leans closer to read the text on the new scroll. In these years I thought back much about my past actions and my embarrassment over my foolishness grows. I know that endangering your lives is not something that can be forgiven lightly and I intend on paying for my mistakes a hundredfold. I hope that should my mistakes come back to haunt us, this knowledge I leave behind will aid the generations that come after. My old and dear friends to Mamo and Varuna. I pray that when we meet again, I can express my regret and offer you a sincere apology. And I, these names are. Sai nods. Tamamo Yuzumaki, Varuna Atsutsuki believed to be the ancestor of the Hyuga, and Anai Atsutsuki believed to be the ancestor of the Achiha. And you believe this scroll to be related to this message? Sasuke asks. I do. Sai responds. Despite being in code, the handwriting is similar. I believe Anai Atsutsuki wrote this accompanying message to inform us this is the item we need, but ensured that only those chosen can read. Now the question is. Toa crosses his arm. Can you read it, descendant of Anai? He motions to Sasuke. Sasuke leans closer and stares at the lettering. He scans every inch with his rinnegan, but it looks like ordinary writing. Sasuke shakes his head. Nothing? Sai scratches his chin under the mask. I thought it may be similar to the tablet the Achiha had under the Naka shrine. Something that can only be read fully as the Sharingan evolves. It doesn't seem to be the case. Then we need to decipher it as soon as we can. Sai opens up a new scroll about the size of the coded one and places them right next to each other. He takes out his writing supplies and after only dipping the very tip of his brush, he places it on the old scroll. As he does, the ink seeps onto the scroll all on its own, snaking its way to the letters and even filling up the empty spaces where letters have been worn out. Ninja art. Living ink. After focusing for a couple of minutes to allow the ink to settle, he moves it from the old scroll and on the new one, where it recreates the lettering perfectly. In case we need a copy of it. I'd like to gather some more important texts before we move on to the next site. Sai says. Next site? Toa cocks his head. Haven't we found what we were looking for? We may have found what we were looking for. Sasuke says. We'd still better check every single location in case we find more. Sai wraps up the copy of the scroll he made and tucks it away. Toa, let's go gather the other scrolls and books. Toa nods and the two of them head to the upper floors to collect whatever else seemed of interest, lost knowledge that may prove valuable. Sasuke and Kamachi remain on the ground floor in complete and slightly awkward silence. As the minutes tick away, Sasuke prepares his chakra for the portal they'll need to reach their other destination. As he does, a sudden jolt runs across his left eye. He grunts in pain and immediately reaches for his eye, holding it in pain. Sir? Kamachi runs toward him. What happened? Sasuke takes a deep breath, the pain having subsided. He takes his hand off his eye only to find his palm bloodied. He runs his fingers under his eye to find hints of blood running from it. Is? Your Rinnegan bleeding? Kamachi asks. 
I thought it wasn't meant to. No, it isn't. I don't know what this is. Should I call? No. Sasuke interrupts her. It's fine. It's nothing. He says in a tone that would imply it's most certainly not nothing. He reaches for some cloth in his bag to wipe away the smears of blood from his palm and cheek. Worried, Kamachi hasn't much of a choice but to trust that Sasuke knows what he's doing. Yuzumaki Clan Training Grounds With a newfound determination and goal, Katori's been putting 110% in training to master her ability. She's seen what it can when used by a master, and she realizes she needs to put it. While she did ask Yezu for help, since he's the one who got an up-close look at Makin's jutsu, Naruto's the one currently training her as this particular jutsu is actually more up his alley. So the two of them are occupying a part of the training ground, while Yezu is elsewhere helping train the Yuzumaki in their forgotten arts. Katori currently has two large condor feathers in her hands, hanging limp in stark contrast to what she actually wants them to do. I just can't figure it out. Katori pouts. Don't worry, we'll get there. Naruto chuckles. Tell me, what do you do when you make your feathers into kunai? She sits down and takes her time to ponder. I don't really know. It just kinda happens, I guess. I want it to hit stuff and it does. I guess it's just more intuitive, huh? Naruto takes one of the feathers from her to inspect it. He pokes around at the base of the feather which is indeed hardened like a kunai. The actual feather probably needs more active attention, so we just need to get you to focus your chakra in the feathers. How do I do that? Well, let's start with this. Naruto reaches for the pouch strapped to his back and takes out his father's three-pronged kunai. He holds it in front of Katori so she can better see what he's about to do. By pumping a small bit of his chakra into the kunai, the blade begins to hum with chakra that coats the edges like an extra sharp layer. I figure this is what we need to do. I can make my kunai sharper by infusing it with wind chakra. Since you have wind chakra, too, it should be the same thing. So I just gotta focus my chakra in the feather? Why don't we start with this? Naruto hands her the kunai. It's made from a special metal that absorbs chakra better. Katori tentatively takes the blade and just goes for it. She focuses her chakra to her hand, in a similar way she focuses it on her feet to walk on water or vertical surfaces, and allows the blade's special properties to do the rest. Katori notices that the coating of chakra is vastly different. With Naruto, it was like a sword made of pure chakra. Sharp. But hers is wobbly and uneven. Naruto smiles, remembering his first real experience when Asuma sensei showed him this technique. Katori squints her eyes. It's weird. Yeah, a little. Naruto chuckles. But it should be basically what you do with your feather kunai. You add chakra to the tips to make them sharper than usual. We just gotta use that same logic on the other side of the feather. But for now, try to get used to the kunai before we use it on your jutsu. Right? Katori nods with vigor before staring at the kunai. How do I do that? Naruto chuckles and sits down on the grass by her side. Right now you're just pumping your chakra, right? Try to visualize it before you do. You want to make a sharp edge, so think of your chakra like two whirling blades clashing. He recalls the advice Asuma gave him what feels like a lifetime ago. That middle part is what you want to focus on. The sharper you can make it, the stronger the kunai will be. Let's give this a shot. Katori imagines her chakra just as Naruto described. It takes a long while of focused concentration, while Naruto sits to the side and observes her progress. She can't help but think of how much she's progressed. It only seems like yesterday that she was trying to figure this stuff out at the orphanage, all on her own. It's sometimes difficult to imagine how much she's changed and how much she's learned. As a kid she couldn't even figure out how to actually use her chakra, but now she's sitting here applying these advanced techniques, and it just feels natural. Like she's always been doing this. She tried for months to get her feathers to do something, yet now in just about an hour or two, she's managed to apply her chakra to the three-pronged kunai to create a much sharper edge. I did it. Katori jumps up to her feet and shows off her progress with a proud grin. Hey, that was pretty fast. Why don't you test it out? Naruto motions to a nearby tree, its bark already etched with cuts from other people's training. Katori takes a stance and gets herself ready for a good throw, not wanting to make a fool out of herself at this stage. She swings her arm and flicks the kunai, having to adjust a bit due to its weirder shape and heavier form. Splinters fly off as the three blades completely disappear from view as it embeds itself deep into the tree. Pretty good. Naruto walks over to retrieve the kunai. We can count this as a success. Watcha mean, of course that was a success. Look how deep it went. Naruto chuckles and ruffles her hair as he walks back up to her. Yeah, and it's pretty good. 
Before Katori can even ask anything further, a blur of something moving faster than she can even register whooshes in front of her face. She blinks, thinking for a second that she imagined it, but the sound of splitting wood and of a thunderous crash make her look around for its origin. On the very tree that she aimed the kunai at, right besides where the wound she made, is an outright hole in the tree and the kunai embedded into a large boulder behind it. She snaps her head to look at Naruto's hand, only to find it empty. That blur. How? She stares in disbelief at how much stronger Naruto's throw was and how much more damage it caused to both tree and rock. That was so much stronger than mine. And we used the same kunai. Naruto chuckles. It's a process. With some training you'll get there, too. But for now, let's move to part two. He takes out a standard kunai from his pouch. He coats it with chakra just as before and throws it at the tree, this time at a speed that Katori can actually comprehend. It doesn't break through the tree this time, but it does go very deep in, deeper than Katori's first throw. Now try the same with a normal kunai. What's even the difference, anyway? She asks as she takes out a kunai of her own. Well, the metal that kunai is made of is rarer and kinda hard to handle, so it's saved for pretty special weapons. It's easier to get your chakra to flow through it. You can do it with normal kunai and shuriken, too, it's just gonna be harder and a bit weaker. He walks over to fetch both kunai he threw. So, Katori stares at her kunai, this is gonna be more challenging. Yep. But you already got a good feel for it. You know how it's supposed to feel, so you just gotta fine-tune it a little bit. Katori sits back down and starts anew. As she pumps chakra into this one, it's definitely a different sensation. She has to take on a more active role in pumping her chakra to coat the blade, and she has to control the shape even more. Even though she managed to already do this, the shape of her chakra is more similar to the wobbly and uneven coating she made at the very beginning. She spends the better part of the afternoon on this simple trick, putting in her all to get to the point she so easily got with the other one. At one point, she lies back to take a short break. How's this gonna help, anyway? She finally asks. Well, the point is to get your feathers to become weapons. If you learn how to properly channel your chakra through them and add your wind style on top of it, you'll have a pretty sharp weapon. Naruto explains. You guys said that Makan guy used fire style with his feathers, right? Katori nods. Yeah. And his were. Giant. Like, bigger than me giant. And the birdie conjured. Well, if we can get your wind style up to par, you should be able to infuse your feathers just like he can. And summon a phoenix? She asks, hopeful. Maybe. He shrugs. Or maybe something else entirely. Either way, I dunno if this is how Makin did it, but this should work, too. Your own brand of your aviary jutsu. He grins. With a heightened motivation, Katori continues her training until a couple of hours later, she manages to reach a point where it's similar to the first part of the training. When she tests it against the target tree, it doesn't go as far as her first attempt, but it's definitely more powerful than a regular throw. So, you think you've gotten the hang of it? Katori takes a deep breath and nods. I think so. Alrighty. So now try strengthening your feather, just like you did with the kunai. Wind style will not only make it sturdy, but give it some reach, too. Katori conjures a large condor feather, the one best suited for what she wants to do. It's even the perfect length, too, being about the size of a tanto or wakizashi, depending on how long she needs the blade to be. Having gotten the hang of the exercise, having managed to enhance a kunai from special metal and a normal kunai, she now feels confident in her attempts. She lets her chakra flow through her hand, into the quill which she's more than used to enhancing when using them as a thrown weapon, into the feather itself, and… nothing? The chakra fizzles out. Katori grumbles and tries it again. And again. And again. It does work a little, there's definitely chakra being channeled through it, but it's nothing like it's supposed to be. Katori pumps as much chakra as she can into, trying to force her way through, but nothing. She reaches a point where Naruto has to restore her chakra reserves, lest she fall from exhaustion. She keeps trying to strengthen it using the method she's been using all day and yet. Nothing. At the odd times she feels she has it, she quickly turns around to slash at the tree, but it only gently brushes at it. She tries again, but there's nothing of how the two kunai felt. Or rather, it's only a fraction. When she hits the tree, she can almost feel as if she's hitting something. Naruto comes to her to inspect, as well. Hmm. <clears throat> he scratches his chin. Looks like we're missing something. Yeah, I'll say. Katori pouts and sits down on the floor. Feather's all ruined now. She looks at the disheveled state of the feather, ruffled from all the times it was brushed against the bark. She sets it aside and creates a new one. 
Naruto picks up the old feather and runs his fingers through the sections of feather that used to be together, looking like one whole, but has now become clear they're just much smaller parts that combine together. He looks back to the part of the tree where Katori was able to actually make a cut albeit very very small ones, and back to the feather. He remembers exactly how Katori swung the feather and what the first point of impact was. He sits down beside her while she starts practicing on the new feather. Why do you think that is? He asks, thinking he might be able to lead her to the answer. Katori shrugs. I dunno. Cause it's just a normal feather, I'm not doing anything to it. Is that what you saw? Well, yeah. Look at it. Katori motions to the old feather in Naruto's hands. Despite being ready to dismiss it as unusable, she sees something with a quick glance. She snatches it from Naruto and inspects the lowest part of the feather. The barbs closest to the quill aren't actually ruined. They're still together and in relatively good shape. It's the rest of it that's ruined. She pumps her chakra into it again, this time running her fingers over the barbs, separating them from one another. As she does, she can feel something new. Something she never felt while doing this with the kunai. The reason she hasn't been able to do with the feather what she did with the kunai is, it's not one whole. She says more to herself than Naruto, piecing things together. It's not one whole. She says louder this time, turning to Naruto with a revelatory grin. Oh, Naruto smiles. And what does that mean? It didn't work cause I was thinking of the feather like one solid thing, but it's not. Each barb is its own thing. So I gotta treat them like their own thing. She hops up to her feet and carefully places the feather by the tree, rather than swinging at it like before. She twists it so that only the lowest parts, the afterfeather and the lower barbs, are in contact with the bark. When she slashes across with more precision, she sees the result. The parts of the feather closest to her hand are actually as strong as a blade, but after that her chakra becomes disrupted and she can't properly flow it through. Now, she at least knows why. Why didn't I sense it before? She mutters to herself. It's easier when you say it out loud, huh? Naruto chuckles. So, the next question is. What are you gonna go now that you know this? Katori scratches her head. You know, I don't actually know. Do I treat each little barb as a separate blade? Or do it in sections? Well, give all methods a shot and see what actually works. Alright. Katori hops in place with newfound motivation. Happy to have figured it out, even if it took several hours of fruitless efforts. Before she can continue, however, their training session is interrupted. Boss, Michi Uzumaki, eldest granddaughter of Elder Awaji, flicker s by their side, herself looking somewhat ragged and tired, clothes slightly charred. Someone from the Hakage's tower stopped by. Said you're being summoned. Granny is? Naruto raises a brow. They say why? Michi shrugs. Nope. Just that you're summoned. Well, I guess that'll be it for today. He looks down to Katori. You wanna head home for now? Katori shakes her head. I'll stay for a bit more. Try and figure it out. All right. Naruto leans down and kisses her on the top of the head. Don't miss dinner, you don't want to make your mom angry. I won't. Katori chuckles and goes back to her feather. Hakage's office. When Naruto opens the door to the Hakage's office, he finds the relatively small room made even smaller by a fairly large gathering. Sonata and Shizuna have their usual place behind the desk, with Kakashi and Shikamaru beside them. Standing in front of the desk are Sasuke, Sai without his mask but still in his Anbu uniform, and Kamachi and Toa who Naruto doesn't recognize and probably wouldn't even if they took off their masks. Surprisingly enough for him, Hinata is also present. Naruto, there you are. Then we can begin. Sonata says before he can even close the door. Naruto looks around in confusion. What's going on? Hinata, you're here, too. He walks up to his wife and waits for an explanation. I'm not entirely sure, either. Hinata answers. It concerns this. Sonata very gently nudges an old worn scroll toward them. We've had a team of Anbu, aided by Sasuke, searching for answers that might help us uncover some answers about dealing with the great beasts. Unfortunately, it's written in code. Shikamaru continues. I ran it by Shiho real quick, but she said she'd need more time to decipher it. It's apparently unlike anything she'd ever seen. It makes sense. Sasuke says. This cipher would be hundreds of years old, it's older than anything we know of. Naruto scratches his head in confusion. So what even is this? It's a message left behind by an Ayatsutsuki. Sasuke explains. Hmm? Huh? Naruto cocks his head. Why's that sound familiar? Sasuke sighs. You're the one who found out about him, remember? An Ayatsutsuki, Varuna Atsutsuki, Tamamo Uzumaki. The ones who sealed the great beasts in the first place. Oh right. Naruto jolts up. 
That guy. Yes, that guy. Sai steps forward and hands them a similarly old note in writing that they can understand. He left behind an uncoded message and we've verified the handwriting matches. We just need to find out what it says. Naruto squints as he leans in to take a closer look at the faded writing. I see. So if the cryptanalysis team hasn't properly looked into it yet, how can we help? Hinata asks. It's a long shot, but we thought there may be some hidden method that only allows certain people to read it. Sonata answers, my Rinnegan couldn't detect anything. My Byakugan couldn't, either. Kamachi says from her spot in the back of the room. But your eyes are much more powerful, Lady Hinata. Sonata shrugs. It's only a hunch, but we know of similar methods that have been used so it's worth a shot. Hinata opens up the scroll with great care, fearful of accidentally damaging it. When she does, they see the coded writing and quickly scan through it to see if it somehow makes sense to them. Naruto shakes his head. Looks like gibberish to me. Hinata? She takes a moment to focus her chakra and takes a step back, knowing that what she's about to do expels quite a bit of chakra from her points. Tensei by Akigen. Hinata's whole body flares up in violet chakra, flowing like flames from body. With her eyes now shining a brighter lavender color, she scans the scroll. She focuses her eyesight in different directions to look at it from all angles, she looks closer at the writing to the point where a single symbol takes up her entire line of sight. However, to her eyes, as well, it looks like an ordinarily written code. She deactivates her dejutsu and shakes her head. I'm sorry, I don't see anything, either. Sonata leans back in her chair. Well, at least we know. If you three can't see anything, then it must be a normal code of some kind. Kakashi, on the other hand, tilts his head sideways to get a better look at it. From his spot by the desk he could faintly see the scroll, albeit upside down, and something caught his eye for just a moment. He squints and leans in to take a closer look. It was a very quick flash, a blink and you'll miss it moment, but Kakashi definitely saw something familiar. Kakashi? Sonata raises a brow. Hmm. Kakashi scratches his chin. I think I was mistaken. For a moment I thought I recognized some words, but it may have been a trick of the light. He straightens himself. Sorry about that. Sasuke steps closer to the desk and nudges the map toward Kakashi. Are you sure? If you have even a slight clue. Kakashi puts up his hands defensively. It does look like I was just mistaken. A trick on these old eyes, perhaps. He sneaks one more glance at the scroll, trying to put his mind to it and see what he saw before, but it's not ringing any bells. Sasuke sighs and steps back. What's got you so agitated? Naruto asks. I think the question is, why aren't you more agitated? Sasuke retorts. This whole thing started with your ancestor and is being finished by your clan. Well, it's kinda hard to think of them as my clan when I only met in Uzumaki for the first time a few years ago. But this is just like any other problem. We got a lot of smart people to figure it out, so we just gotta trust them and be ready to act. Naruto says. Sasuke sighs once again. You're far too optimistic. Naruto claps him on the shoulder and grins. Believe in your comrades, Sasuke. While those two are having their little moment, Shikamaru furls the scroll back up and motions to Kamachi and Toa. Take this to Shiho Aburama over at Cryptanalysis. Yes sir. They do as ordered, disappearing in a flash. Then, you're all free to go home. Sonata releases them. I'm sorry this didn't wield any actual results. Hinata takes a bow before leaving. Please call on us if you have further suspicions. Yeah, granny, we'll come running. Naruto reaffirms her words. Sonata chuckles. I'll keep that in mind. As Naruto and Hinata head out, Sasuke and Sai walk out with them. Say, how about we grab a drink? Naruto turns to his two former teammates. It's been a while. I'd love to, Sai smiles, but it's been a while since I was properly home. I'd like to go to Yakumo and Kenso. Maybe another day. Aw, oh, alright. Then it'll just be you and me, Sasuke. Sasuke holds his hand up to stop him before he gets his hopes up too much. I'll pass, too. You in a hurry to get home, too? Naruto snickers. Excited to see Sakura? Sasuke pauses for a moment before answering. No, I just don't feel like it. Wow. Blunt. Naruto laughs. All right, then I guess we'll meet up some other day. Hinata chuckles and intertwines her arm with Naruto's. Looks like we're going home. As the four part ways, each heading to their own families, Sasuke lingers back for a moment. He lets out a grunt, a pained growl as if he'd been holding back for a long time. He reaches to apply pressure to his throbbing eye that's been in excruciating pain this entire time. Damn it, why? He removes his hand from his eye and looks at the blood on his palm. This shouldn't be happening. Sir? Kamachi's voice snaps his attention away from his current state. 
Why didn't? Not a word. He cuts her off. Not a single word about this, do you understand? She remains silent for a moment, her mask hiding her expression which may well give away her thoughts. Yes sir. Sasuke walks away, rubbing his eye. Yuzumaki household. That very night, Naruto twists and turns in his bed like he never has before. He's usually not the most quiet sleeper, and Hinata often finds herself with little space to sleep once Naruto adjusts to odd sleeping positions, but even she's not seen anything like this. If she didn't know any better she'd say he was having a nightmare, but she's beginning to worry it might be more serious. Try as she might, he just isn't waking up. Whatever's causing his spasms. Unbeknownst to her, the reason Naruto won't wake up despite her attempts is because his mind is far away in a remote place, and the reason his body is convulsing is because every fiber of his being is racing with worry and fear. Naruto stands in the shared mind space, the gathering spot for all tailed beasts. Everyone is gathered, even Killer B, except for two. They all stand motionless, faces twisted in anger. The third Torii gate, marked with three, and the fifth Torii gate, marked with five, lie broken and ruined. The tall and proud gates that served as an entrance point for them have been destroyed, and Naruto can feel his connection to Isobu and Kakuuo has been severed. What the fuck happened? End of chapter 80 Changed names. Kuganekamata. Changed from Kuga Tsumitogi. New last name comes from the cat-like yakai of the same name. Also keeps them more in line with the Inuzuka and Arakami clans, of having the name of their companion animal in their clan name. Setsuin. Setsu equals snow, and can mean circle, similarly to how all known Nin Ken have the Meru ending. She was also changed from a black panther to a white tiger, which fits with Kuga's inspiration in the first place. Takeshi Amori. Changed from Takeshi Takage. New last name comes from the gecko like yakai of the same name. These names fit better than the old ones in my opinion, and this way all three of them are named after a yakai, as Mizushi is another name for the kappa. Tensigen to Tensei by Akugen. Since canonically, the Tensigen can only be achieved by an Atsutsuki implanting a by Akugen in themselves, Hinata's was always meant to be a slightly weaker version of what Tanari used, a mutation that resulted from her being exposed to the energy vessel in the movie. So it wasn't really the actual Tensigen, so I thought it better to change it to Tensei by Akugen. Chapter 81. Interlude Part 3. Power of Human Sacrifice. Tashiwaka Town, Land of Hot Waters. Although Tashiwaka is a somewhat small town, it started to attract a lot of people to it. The Busan Esseners have been steadily putting more and more effort into making itself a desired hot springs town. The local Ryakan owners put all their money and effort into expanding to offer more comfortable accommodations and better services than other hotspots in the land of hot waters. As such, it was difficult for Kaitamaru to resist taking a dip in some of the best onsen this land has to offer. After all, this is technically part of his domain. Since the land of hot waters foolishly disbanded their hidden village to focus on their tourism, they had little to no protection from great threats. The emergence of Kaguya Atsutsuki and the Divine Tree scared them quite a bit, and the land of woods and the hidden mountain village took the opportunity to pose as their would-be protectors. Truthfully that may have been possible even if they still had their hidden village. Quite frankly, the only remarkable thing they've ever truly done is produce a member of the Akatsuki and Kaitamaru who still isn't sure how someone from this village got to that level of strength. Still, it's not like he's here just to relax. That's an extra. No, he's here lying in wait for his target, someone who's been making rather good use of the crowded town in order to lie low. Unfortunately for him, the land of Wood Zanbu is good at their job. And unfortunately for him, the innkeep blabbed about what times he uses the onsen. Right on cue, the man enters. An unassuming man of average stature, short brown hair, and only a towel around his waist, naturally. He acknowledges Kaitamaru's presence with a nod and goes to wash his body as is customary before entering. All the while, Kaitamaru nurses his sacket, placed on a tray that floats around in the water. The two occasionally glance over at each other, Kaitamaru because he's eyeing his target and the man because he just seems to naturally be suspicious. When their eyes meet, they just play it off. When the man finishes cleaning himself, he walks in the onsen, resting on the opposite side of Kaitamaru. It sure is hot, isn't it? Kaitamaru makes a casual remark. The other man raises a brow. Yes, it is. It's a hot spring, after all, that's the point. Kaitamaru takes a sip of sake. Of course not nearly as hot as your phoenix's fire. He chuckles. 
The man narrows his eyes at the sudden statement, his body tenses beneath the water as he's already prepared to make a move. Pardon? Kaitamaru dismissively waves his hand. Oh, there's no need for that. I'm not really a fan of dragging things out. If there's work to be done, then simply do it. So why don't you come closer and we can share a drink? He pauses for slight dramatic effect, Makin of Clan Hoyoku. As soon as he hears his name, Makin readies himself to lunge forward. He'd already gathered some chakra in his hand, and with a flick of his wrist, a large feather appears in his palm. He had his foot on the side for additional support and to give himself a boost if he needed to go. He was prepared and he's not someone to be caught off guard. Usually. Despite all of his preparations and him keeping a very close eye out, he was somehow not prepared for someone else to be in the room. Before he can move even an inch towards Kaitamaru, another man presses a kunai to his forehead from behind. Don't. Takeshi says. Before Makin can even fully register the appearance of Takeshi, donning only an oni mask and a towel, something else flashes before him. Kaitamaru closes the distance in the blink of an eye, and he has an oversized axe on Makin's throat. What the fuck? Makin curses to himself. Where did this guy come from? I scanned the area, I know there was no one else here. He looks back to Kaitamaru. And this guy. He's fast, and where did he get that axe from? Damn it all. Kaitamaru presses his axe against Makin's throat before pulling it back and laughing. You don't need to put on such a constipated look. I did say I just wanted to share some sake. He looks back to the tray that was beside him, only to find that he'd tipped it over when he rushed at Makin and spilled the sake in the water. Or maybe just a conversation. That's fine, too. Makin looks between the two and realizes it best to play along for now. He takes a better look at the one still threatening him with a kunai and notes the mask, the only distinguishing thing about him. That mask? It's the Hanyu Black Ops. Hidden Mountain Anbu. He turns back to Kaitamaru and gives him a look over. So you, with the red hair and large axe, must be Kaitamaru Sakata. Kaitamaru smiles. I'm glad we're on the same page. It makes things much easier. Takeshi, please release our friend. Takeshi pulls his weapon away and steps back into the steam, erasing his presence entirely. He's good. Makin notes. I can't even sense him. To think the mountain had someone like that. So why these Thetrix? He asks Kaitamaru. If you're going to capture me, then capture me. Oh, I want nothing of the sort. I have no intention of giving you to the Shinobi Union, you're far too valuable an asset for that. Makin raises a brow. Isn't the Hidden Mountain part of the Shinobi Union? Oh, there's a lot of things about on, Makin, but how about I ask the questions first? Kaitamaru leans back against the edge of the onsen and glares. Makin decides it best to cooperate, if only out of sheer curiosity, as to what a village leader wants with him. Ask away. Jensui Amajiri. How did he find out about the Great Beast? I've been dying to know. I'm afraid you'll be disappointed, seeing as I don't know much. Makin shrugs. Jensui's plans were already well underway when I went to the Hidden Dream Village. He apparently found some old texts in the Tenro clan's old homeland, found evidence of their secret weapon's identity. A secret passed on and eventually forgotten. Kaitamaru rubs chin. And you decided to join his cause even though it had nothing to do with you? Makin shrugs. He had big aspirations and a way of attaining great power. It seemed interesting and a way to topple the status quo. With as few movements as possible, Makin tries to scan the area to see if he can sense the Anbu's presence and get out with his life. There's no way I'm dying naked, damn it. So what'll you say if I propose something even more interesting? Kaitamaru offers. Something much grander than what Jensui Amajiri was planning? Much more destructive. Makin raises a brow. You. Do you plan to betray the Shinobi Union? Kaitamaru reels his head back in laughter. Oh, my friend before lowering his gaze, turned from jovial to sharp and dedicated. I was never on their side to begin with. And you're telling me this before I've even agreed, because. Because if you refuse, it won't matter what information you carry to the grave. Kaitamaru finishes the sentence. Such bold statements. I did say I like to get to the point. Our plans are close to finalization. We've amassed forces, allies, weapons. We could use someone like you on our side when all of it comes unleashed. You and the Amajiri clan you've brought with you. I don't imagine keeping a low profile forever sounds like a fun endeavor. A slight smile creeps on Makin's face, a mixture of amusement at the prospect and disbelief that any of this is even happening. And let's say I humor the idea. What would be involved in joining you? Most likely not much else from what you were going to do for Jensui. We tear down the union from the inside and tear down the great nations one by one, until they can no longer step on all of us at a whim. 
so that's it, huh, it's some kind of revenge ploy against a big five, Machen asks, aren't we all driven by at least some sense of revenge or anger or negativity in general, to prove someone wrong or to give them a taste of their own medicine, it's all very rewarding, can't say I disagree with that, so how about this, you come with me and my team to perform a very specific task, and you get to see a glimpse of our strength, if it seems interesting to you, we can continue talking, Kaitamaru extends a hand, well, given that the alternative is a fight to the death, why not, you've piqued my curiosity, Makin smirks and returns the handshake. The two remain in the onsen for a little while longer, choosing to enjoy the place while they're here, no need for a perfectly good bath to go unused, after all, even if the atmosphere is somewhat tense due to the whole threatening and all. At one point, someone else does try to enter the onsen, but is quickly scared off by the appearance of a dagger at his chest. He doesn't even stay around long enough to see who threatened him with the dagger. When the two decide that enough is enough, they leave. Takeshi, you can go. I'll handle the rest, you go catch up with your group. Yes sir. Takeshi's voice comes from the ether. Despite being present when the order is given, Makin still isn't sure if he should actually trust a disappearing shinobi is actually gone, or how many other disappearing shinobi Kaitamaru Sakata has. They make their way out of the village while keeping completely out of sight, on their way to rendezvous with Kaitamaru's lot, so they can discuss more openly. As far as either of them is aware, no one should be following them. They're competent shinobi in their own right, and Makin is certain no one is following them, besides possible that Takeshi and Kaitamaru is well aware he ordered everyone to leave. It's just them two until they reach the clearing where the mountain shinobi are gathered, except for one presence that doesn't make itself known until the very last second. For anyone else, it would be too late to react. Anyone else would have lost their head already when a third person appeared behind them, swinging two swords right at their necks. Luckily for them, they're not just anyone. Makin reacts in the last possible moment by conjuring a feather blade in his hand to block the sword, while Kaitamaru dodges out of the way just in time, losing only a few strands of hair. Makin and Kaitamaru skid back and face the third person for battle. Makin conjures a second feather to his hand, and Kaitamaru unfurls a scroll on his hip to summon his axe from its seal. They now get a better look at their assailant. A man of wild red hair, shorter than Kaitamaru's, and the lower half of his face covered by the mask of Anoni's grin. His body is bare save for the bandages his torso and forearms are wrapped in. As he looks over the two of them, his katana flare up and become enveloped in fire. Kaitamaru smirks. Sikai of Clan Miyashi. What a surprise. Makin notes the half of a mask and its familiar design. The Hanya mask. He then turns one of his feather blades toward Kaitamaru. He's one of yours? Is this some kind of trick, Kaitamaru? No, he is most definitely not one of mine. Kaitamaru answers, not even paying attention to the feather pointed at him. Yet, it's a trophy from years ago, Sikai answers, when I crossed paths with the old Hanyu group. Kaitamaru straightens himself but remains in a battle-ready position. So what brings a bounty hunter from the land of wind all the way to the land of hot waters? A bounty. Sikai raises one of his katana toward Makan. And apparently a traitor. He raises the other toward Kaitamaru. One of the shinobi union leaders having a nice stroll with the most wanted man. I wonder how much Ryo I'll get for you, Kaitamaru Sakata. Sikai wonders. Why would you even care? Kaitamaru asks. The Miyashi clan hates the hidden village, so why are you even taking jobs for us? Sikai shrugs. The pay's good, and if I can steal the bounty from under one of you pampered village kids' noses, all the better. Makin chuckles. Vindictive, I like it. It's a shame you'll fail. We might have gotten along in other circumstances and shared sake at an onsen. Sikai raises a brow at the oddly specific statement. Kaitamaru grips his axe with two hands and readies it by his side to swing as necessary. I suppose I'll have to get you to calm down with a good old-fashioned beating. You'll try. Sikai hisses. The air around Sikai grows dry. Kaitamaru and Makin see the air visibly begin to ripple as the result of intense heat. Sikai's entire body and katana begin to let out smoke, which gives way to a bright white flame that instantly sets nearby foliage, and even the ground itself, on fire. Ninja art fire style? A Kurijin. Oh, Makin smirks. If you think fire will work on me, you've come sorely underprepared. With a set of wings forming on his back and two feathers in his hands, he flies up high in the air. Dozens of giant feathers, which would be shining bright because of their natural red and orange coloring, even if they weren't set on fire, materialize around him and cluster together to create the towering form of a fiery avian. Lost aviary. Phoenix. 
The phoenix stomps on the ground, setting everyone around it ablaze just by virtue of being near it. It lets out a piercing screech, small bits of ember flying from deep within its throat. Everyone's so intense. Kaitamaru chuckles. If you'll pardon the pun, I think I'll cool those emotions. He forms a set of hand signs and grabs the edge of his great axe, digging into his palm to draw blood. As it drips down the axe, jutsu formulae spread over the side of the axe head. Summoning? Water style? Tides of Bua. From the formulae, a deluge of water bursts forth in what first seems an uncontrolled flood, but soon the water begins to swirl around Kaitamaru like a flowing ribbon. The side of the ring closer to the phoenix begins to slightly sizzle from the bird's presence. Makan eyes Kaitamaru and the water he just conjured with great interest and curiosity. For the water to not be evaporating when this close to the phoenix. You're a curious one, Kaitamaru Sakata. Sikai looks up at the phoenix and whistles with a hint of admiration. Summoning birds and feathers. You have the same jutsu as that kid. He recalls the very brief time he actually met Katori after the truce with Naruto and Gurren. Oh, Makan cocks his head. Have you met Katori, by any chance? You simply must tell me about it. With his feathers still in his hands, he performs a set of hand signs while the phoenix reels its head back. When he finishes, it extends its head forward, neck blowing as the blanket of fire leaves its body and encompasses the entire area around it. Fire style? Flames of rebirth. The resulting jutsu blocks almost all field of vision not just for its size, but the hot flames create a bright light that forces Kaitamaru to look away for a moment. Anything that wasn't already set ablaze from Sikai and Makans just is now burning, smoke billowing in the air. When the flame of rebirth dies down, they scan the area but see no sign of Sikai. That is, until Kaitamaru spots something from the corner of his eye. A figure that he may have otherwise missed if he wasn't glowing with white flames. Sikai comes rushing in from the side, katana aimed right at Kaitamaru's head, but he raises his greetings to block them both. The clash of Akurajan's white fire and Bua's pure water sends steam rising in the air, but it's nowhere near the amount Sikai expected. Kaitamaru swings his axe to push Sikai away, and in doing so sends a wave of water that's blocked by a shield of binding cloth. When Sikai retracts the cloth, his eyes widen as he sees some of his flames extinguished, both on the cloth and on certain parts of his katana. This is, like what Naruto did. He's the only one to have ever extinguished Akurajan's flames. He stares down Kaitamaru and the water that flows from his axe. Is it the same jutsu? Or similar? Kaitamaru swings the axe over his shoulder. This water is from Lake Bua, home of the catfish. I'm afraid even your fire isn't going to be enough. Their stare down is interrupted by a rain of feathers that pierce into the ground. Feather Kunai Barrage. Sikai uses some of his binding cloth to swat away at them, while other parts snake their way to the nearby trees. He uses them to pull himself away from danger while still using his swords for defense. So versatile, that cloth. Kaitamaru admires Sikai's maneuverability. Once Makan's barrage ends, the phoenix runs forward and stomps on the ground where Sikai is moving about. The ground underneath is upturned, trees are snapped and crushed, on top of them also being set aflame. It swings its mighty wing to create a gust of hot air in an attempt to knock Sikai off his balance. Seeing as his means to zipping around have been mostly crushed, he does get knocked off his balance and is sent flying away. Kaitamaru raises his axe high above his head, water following its movements in an oddly mesmerizing display. He forms his hand signs despite gripping onto the handle with both hands and slams it into the ground, digging deep into it. Water style? Great waterfall. The water bursts forth in a giant vortex, going right past the phoenix and aimed to hit Sikai. He, however, manages to send a piece of cloth just in time to grab onto a nearby fallen tree to get away from it. What water was left behind begins to lightly steam from being nearby so much intense flames, while the majority of the water bursts onward and creates a massive indent in the ground from the force it exerted. Sikai decides now's his time to go on the offensive. Fire style? Great flame destruction. He takes a deep breath and spews out his own sea of flames, large enough to cover most of the phoenix, and targeted to catch both Kaitamaru and Makan in its infernal wake. Makan commands the phoenix to protect him with its wing, while Kaitamaru slightly flicks the axe as it's still embedded in the ground. Water style? Water shield. A protective bubble forms around just before the flames can reach him. When the fire dies down, Makan flies from under the phoenix wing and the two begin to pelt Sikai with fiery feathers which he avoids or deflects best that he can. Fire style? Feather kunai. Did you think your fire's hot enough to harm a phoenix? Makan mocks. Was kind of hoping it was, yeah. Sikai cuts the feathers before they can reach him. 
The phoenix steps in front of Makan and brings down its massive claws onto Sikai. He dodges and uses his cloth to wrap around its leg to pull himself closer to it. It burns. He may be immune to the heat of his own ecorigen, but that doesn't make him immune to all fire unlike this phoenix. Right now he can mainly rely on his cloth to get him by until he can find a way to get in the air and grab Makan. Surely if the caster is knocked out, the phoenix will disappear, too, right? He tries to do exactly that, sporadically using his cloth to swing around the phoenix to dodge its claws and wings. Just when he thinks he's managed to trick it and jump above it, it swats its wing to push him away. Won't be that easy. Makan smirks. Sikai manages to cushion his fall by first sending his cloth to grab onto charred trees to slow his momentum. He tumbles to the ground and rolls back before he can catch himself. Before he can even think of his next move, the ground underneath his cracks. At first he wonder about an earth style he wasn't aware of, but that theory is almost immediately debunked when he hears the sound of rushing water. He jumps back just in time to avoid a pillar of water that shoots out from the ground, but it's barely a moment later when more of the ground cracks. It's not just the spot in front him, but almost the entire clearing he's in. Dozens of other pillars burst out and coil around him in a dome of water that rapidly shrinks in on him. The area is so large that even the phoenix has to fly up and away to avoid it. Water style? Great water prison. Damn it. Sikai curses his luck. He forms the hand signs of his fire style in a last-ditch attempt to burn the water away. Maybe if he can put all of his chakra into it, he can make it hot enough, Lake Dua or whatever be damned. Before he can finish, however, the water fully encases him and crushes him under its pressure. He tries to move his body and maybe swim away, but it takes too much strength to move his arm, let alone swim. Kaitamaru runs forward with his axe in hand, which is connected to the water prison by a ribbon of water, and jumps right in. Unlike Sikai, he doesn't seem to be affected at all by the massive pressure, and is able to move around freely, like he's taking a relaxing dive. Sikai tries to swing his now extinguished katana, but it's futile. Kaitamaru swings his great axe and slams him full force into his chest with the brunt side. Sikai is sent crashing into the ground as the water is released and floods the ground. Kaitamaru jumps down to the barely holding himself together Sikai and grabs his hand. Sikai tries to pull away, but he doesn't have the strength after being crushed and battered. Time for you to learn where you belong, cousin. Kaitamaru whispers so just Sikai can hear. Kaitamaru forms a set of joint hand signs, using both of their hands. Jutsu formulae begin to spread over both of their hands and eventually cover their arms and necks. Forbidden Jutsu? Bloodline Regression. Sikai screams in agony as his mind becomes flooded with visions. He sees an old man running from and eventually captured by enemy shinobi. He sees the old man treated like dirt, abused and beaten. He manages to recognize him as a slightly younger version of his father, Asuka Uzumaki. He sees everything his father went through, things he was never aware of. How he found himself amongst a Miyashi clan where he found some semblance of peace. But that's not all he sees. He sees the memories of other Uzumaki, ones who weren't as lucky as Asuka, ones who suffered much more hardship than he thought possible. His mind becomes filled with their words. Curses. Desires. Wishes. Their anger, their agony, their hatred for the enemies who drove them to this pathetic state, and hatred for the allies who abandoned them. How dare they? Bastards who got too confident, who need to be taught a lesson and learn their place under our heels. Kaitamaru lets go of Sikai's hand and steps back. When Sikai tries to push himself up to his feet, Makan flies down with his blades ready, but Kaitamaru stops him. Wait. It's okay now. Sikai gets up with some difficulty and a lot of pain. When he turns around to face the other two and lifts his head, tears stream down his eyes. I, I didn't know. Kaitamaru nods. Many don't at first. To think I've been so blind. And that I planned on helping them by capturing you. Sikai clenches his fist. They have to pay. They all have to pay. He screams out. They can't get away with everything they've done to us. Makan raises a brow. What's he even talking about? Where's all this coming from? Kaitamaru extends a hand. Then help me do exactly that, Sikai Uzumaki. Sikai readily takes the hand and shakes it. I'm sorry for attacking you, but I'm good now. Tell me what you need of me. Kaitamaru smirks. I'm glad you asked. Makan can't help but take a single weary step back, every part of his body telling him something is wrong and there's danger afoot. What the fuck? He did a complete 180. That last jutsu. Did Kaitamaru somehow take over his mind or put him under some kind of genjutsu? Does he plan to do that with? No, he could have just done it to me at any point if that's what he wanted. Now that the 
Misunderstanding has been cleared, shall we continue to our destination, the three of us? Kaitamaru says. We still have actual work that needs doing. He looks to the side and notices Makin's clear discomfort. I did tell you I'd show you interesting things. Consider this an unexpected sample. Kaitamaru returns his great axe back to its scroll as Sekai fetches his katana and sheathes them. Yeah, sure, Makin says as he walks toward them, keeping his distance. Land of Earth Kakuo has enjoyed her free time as much as she's been able to. To not be sealed inside anyone, to roam the lands she once called home without any disturbances. Land of Earth is probably her favorite place to gallop as it's full of white open terrain. Land of Lightning is good, too, because she has a lot of mountains and hills to hop to and from, but this is where she can really pick up speed. Land of Fire has too many forests, and she's worried about trampling some innocent creatures home, and Land of Wind is just not good for running. Or breathing. It's not a fun place at all. Despite the circumstances she'd found herself in the past few dozen years as a prisoner, she can't help but feel a connection to this place. She may have hated the ones who sealed her away, but she was able to reconcile with Han at the very end, and the shinobi of the world have seen the error of their ways in keeping them locked and used as a source of power. So she's able to enjoy herself and even interact with some shinobi from time to time, while putting past animosity aside. Right now, however, she's resting from a relaxing spring through the lands, nestled in a canyon of sorts to hide from the scorching sun. She's lying down peacefully although there's something that's bothering her. She can't quite put her hoof on it as it's more of a feeling than sensing. She can't pinpoint what exactly but she feels uneasy even though looking around, she can't sense or see anything that should be causing her worry. Despite this, she still feels the need to pick up her pace. She'll just take a nice job and move on from this place. That is, if she would was given enough time. Ninja art. Summoning. Rashomon. From the sides of the canyon, two enormous gates appear, visages of angered being decorating the front, and only now do two figures appear right in front of her eyes where there were none before. Takeshi releases his invisibility and opposite him, Kuga becomes visible, as well, as the little chameleon on her shoulder goes back to its home. Yuzumaki clan seal. Release. Both Rashomon gates swing open, unleashing the beasts trapped within. Nu and Amakiri jump out, free, despite the shackles that still adorn their legs, or claws in Amakiri's case, and tails. An ambush? Now? Kakuo doesn't wait long to spring into action. She dashes toward Nu, propelled by steam bursting from her hind hooves. She jumps to the top of the cliffside and dives in headfirst. Horn breaking. Nu roars, gathers lightning at the tip of its paws, and slams Kakuo's head in an attempt to stop her rampage. It works slightly, as Kakuo is pushed aside and hurt by the electricity, but Nu itself is also pushed away. Kuga and her tigress Setsuin use this chance to slip away while the monsters fight. Amakiri flies at the dazed Kakuo and tries to grab her with its claws, but she kicks it away and releases a cloud of scalding steam in its face. It screeches and flies out to gather itself. Kakuo tries to keep them off her and at least keep it one-on-one, -on -one, but they become better at avoiding her attacks. Nu lashes out with lightning from afar that Kakuo can dodge out of the way, but Hamakiri flies in to intercept. When she tries to burn it with steam again, it simply raises its claw and snaps the sneak cloud in half, rendering it inert. Kakuo clicks her tongue. Of course, it has this annoying ability. She resorts to dodging for now, using her steam propulsion to maneuver around more easily. The three of them deliver crushing blows to one another, with Kakuo using her strong legs and head to her advantage, but Nu can keep away with its lightning, and Amakiri can dive in and out easily. Still, she takes any win she can. At one point in their scuffle, Kakuo finds an opening she'd been looking for. With Amakiri around, she couldn't use the most powerful weapon in her arsenal, but she manages to interpose herself between the two in such a way to kick Amakiri away and keep it out of the fight long enough. She turns to Nu and gathers a ball of black chakra at the tip of her jaw. Tailed Beast B. Before she can actually do it, something pierces her body and digs deep, like a giant pike. Then another, and another. She looks back at the source of her pain to see dozens of chains made of pure chakra sticking into her, and following them to their source, she sees two groups of masked shinobi who are floating in the air. The space around them shimmers to reveal two large chameleons who'd been invisible until now. Where did they come from? How could I not sense them? Kakuo tugs at the chains in an attempt to break free, but they prove strong. The shinobi all jump out. The ones who have their chains grappling Kakuo stay back, and somehow their grip becomes only more powerful. They all become surrounded by reddish cloaks of chakra that form a skeletal figure around them. Susano, 
The remainder of the assailants rush forward. Some of them stop partway through and slam their hands on their ground. Earth style? Moving Earth core. The area under Kakuo shifts and, unable to escape, she finds herself sinking as the space underneath her moves down. The third group of shinobi stop at the edge and pelt her with lightning and fire style. Kakuo tries to unleash a cloud of steam, but she finds herself unable to use her chakra as she pleases. She feels it being drained through some of the chains holding onto her. At this rate, she'll barely be able to stand. From the side, Takeshi and Kuga observe the assault. It's working. Kuga crosses her and watches closely. Sending those who can drain chakra to the five tails was a smart move. Takeshi nods. They can absorb its chakra from a safe distance while remaining unharmed by the steam. They both flinch when a sudden crash of thunder pierces the sky. Nu strikes down a powerful lightning bolt from the skies, while Amakiri beats Kakuo down with its powerful claws. Even the moving earth core squeezes at her from all sides. Eventually, she finds herself helpless and drained of chakra. Then, the assailants move on with their plan. The ones holding Kakuo down with chains step on the edge, while two jump down on her back. Nu and Amakiri hold Kakuo down in addition to the chains, applying more pressure than necessary. Jutsu formulae spread under the feet of the Uzumaki members, the circular formation expanding until it reaches the formulae of the ones next to them. When they meet, they spread further into the hold toward the tailed beast. This is a seal. Kakuo struggles to break free to no avail. She doesn't have the strength of the chakra to fight back. She tries to form a tailed beast bomb, but she can't focus. Even if she could, Amakiri stops her by clasping onto her jaw with its powerful claws. I can't reach the others in my state. I can't focus. One of the Uzumaki onto Kakuo places an arm on the tailed beast's back and looks to the woman behind her, who's stripped down to only a wrapping around her chest. Are you ready, Jun? Jun gives a confident nod. Yes. The Jutsu formulae spread onto Kakuo's entire body and into the arm of the first woman. The writing swirls up her body and onto her other arm, which is when she places her arm on Jun's stomach where the sealing is finalized. Ganjin seal. Jun cries out in pain as the foreign chakra is sealed in her body, but she fights through it. Please be safe, everyone. Kakuo's final thoughts don't reach her siblings. The five tailed beast's form shrinks, her body turning to pure chakra as she's sucked into the seal on Jun's body. Once the process is over, Jun falls to the ground and pants. The other shinobi cheer over their success. Nu and Amakiri are dragged back into the Rashomon gates, pulled by the shackles on their body. When everything has settled, Kuga and Takeshi jump in and offer Jun help in getting back up. Well done. Kuga smirks. This power. Jun pants. It's incredible. Such is the power of the tailed beasts. I know your body must be in pain right now, but we must move. We can't allow ourselves to be spotted. Yes sir. Jun nods. I hope the other team has as much success as us. I'm sure they will. They have Kaitamaru with them, after all. The two chameleons from before hop by and allow everyone to once again climb in their mouths, where they can remain unseen when the chameleons turn invisible. North Great Barrier Sea Ever since the Fourth Great Ninja War, things have been pleasantly calm for Asobu. He's had free range to roam the lands as much as he pleases these past five years, although there's been quite a bit of tension with the great beasts being released from their prison. At least he's been able to keep an eye out, while free to swim to his heart's content. Best part is, he doesn't even have to worry about Shinobi. Since the war, the Union has issued that any attempts to capture the great beasts would be treated as an act of war against a Union. Since the Union is composed of the most powerful Shinobi villages, no one really intends to go against that. Even if they wanted to, it's not like the smaller villages have the manpower to capture them. The only thing he's really had to deal with is being treated as a sea monster. Sure, the shinobi are all in the know about them, but ordinary folk aren't. Asobu has heard many stories about an island-sized turtle that sinks ships. That's hearsay. He's never sunk a ship, it's all storms and poor planning on the captain's part. They're just using him as a scapegoat to hide their own incompetence. Well, it's not like he interacts much with the humans, anyway. Normal folk can't reach him underwater, and shinobi rarely seek him out. Which is why, it's weird to him that he's sensing some humans' approach. Normally he's not a sensor type, that's more Karama's deal, but here in the water he can sense the disturbances of several dozen people coming right to him. Even though they've been at peace, he's not about to let people think they can disturb him as they please. From his resting spot nestling into a hold on the seafloor, Asobu slams his leg on the ground. From the resulting rumble, coral pillars jut out from the ground to form a barrier. A warning to halt. These people do not halt. 
they swim over the coral and continue forward. Isobu swims up and lashes out with his three tails to create a massive wave. Stop and state your business. His booming voice carries itself underwater, perfectly audible. Now that he's gotten in view with his visitors, he can see what they look like. Clothing that he doesn't recognize as belonging to any hidden village and pale white masks that hide their face. Identify yourselves. The strangers do not. Instead, they all raise their arms in front of them and immediately go on the offensive. Water style? Whirlpool. With their combined might, the water around Asobu begins to rapidly swirl with enough force to drag him along with it. The whirlpool grows smaller and faster, with the ultimate goal being to crush its intended target. This target, however, intends to fight back. You dare. Asobu curls up into a ball and begins spinning himself. He spins faster and faster, ironically aided by the whirlpool, to the point where the whirlpool itself can't keep up with him. In a burst, the water jutsu breaks and sends another wave at the assailant. Toward the back, Kaitamaru and Mizushi lie in wait, similarly dressed and masked to hide their identities. Ready, Mizushi? Kaitamaru asks as he cuts his palm, blood trickling into the water, before performing a set of hand signs. Ready. In contrast Mizushi doesn't cut his palm and forms a different set. They both slam their bloodied palms onto a rocky surface. Ninja art. Summoning. Ninja art. Summoning. Rashomon. A monstrous gate emerges from the ground behind Mizushi, while a large black catfish, nearly as large as Asobu himself, appears in the water by Kaitamaru's side. Go, Namazu. Kaitamaru orders the catfish. It swims toward Asobu, fishing jets of water to keep him occupied. That's the Rashomon Gate? I don't know what you're planning, but there's no way I'll let you. Asobu curls into a spiky ball and rolls his way away from his assailants and right for the catfish, although it's not his target, either. Shell Spear. As Asobu draws near, Namazu Barrel rolls out of the bulldozing Asobu's way, but in doing so creates a vortex in the water. A vortex that considerably slows Asobu's spin long enough so he can't interfere. Yuzumaki Clan's Seal. Release. Mizushi opens the Rashomon. The metal bells fall to the ground, metal chains dragging along and lessening their grip on the gates, so they can fly open. The kappa emerges from within and on seeing Asobu, flies into a rage and swims right for him. It gathers a stream of water in its mouth and releases a thin stream of water. Asobu dodges it in time so it instead split the rocks behind him in two. Asobu now finds himself at a disadvantage with Namazu and kappa coming at him from all sides. Kappa tries to get in close to grapple him, but when he tries to escape, Namazu is right there to meet him. It uses its massive tail to strike at Asobu's unprotected underbelly, which only gives Kappa the chance to strike at his sturdier shell. Kappa's strength allows it to actually strike the shell and now hurt its own hands in the process. Asobu fights well, but this puts him at a disadvantage. After taking far too many hits for his own comforts, he swings his tails to give himself a speed boost and swim upward and away from them. When he gets enough distance, he turns back and gathers a mass of black chakra at the tip of his jaw that he fires at Kappa. Tailed Beast Bomb. The explosion sends a large ripple of water that shakes the entire area therein. When he finally reaches the surface to get his bearings, he's immediately assaulted by an even greater force. Multiple lightning-style jutsu strike him to great effect as it travels through the water he's completely drenched in. When the lightning strikes stop, dozens of shinobi charge directly at him. The Amajiri clan, transformed into their insectoid form, horns crackling with electricity. As they impact, the Soba reels from the second surge of electricity, but swats them all away. It's then that he notices the third threat, up in the sky. Makin's phoenix is flying high above with Sikai's fiery form standing on top of its head, while Makin himself flies next to them. They waste no time. Fire style? Flames of rebirth. Fire style? Great fire destruction. Asobu cries out as the inferno hits him. He steps out, but he's already staggered from the heat that burned his flesh, even after only a second of exposure. He curls up in a ball and begins spinning with the intent to jump up and bulldoze the phoenix, but he's caught before he can. Not by someone but something. Chains made of pure chakra shoot out of the water, dig their way into him, wrapping around him and restraining him. Adamantine sealing chains. Namazu jumps out of the water and hits him with its tail, Kappa swims up and grabs onto him, and squeezes tight enough to crack the shell. Asobu gathers another massive chakra at his jaw, but Kappa clamps his jaw shut. He tries to fight back, to get away from Kappa's grip and to break away from the chain. As he tries, several giant feathers, burning with the same intense fire he was hit with before, fly down and dig into his legs. From a combination of pain and heat, he can't struggle as he did. 
The shinobi who attacked him first rise from the water in a sight that sends a shiver down Asobu's spine. They're each enveloped in chakra constructs of various shades of red, warrior forms that protect their user and are holding the chains that are keeping Asobu down. That's the Achiha clan's Susano. Kaitameru steps toward him and stops right in front of his face. Don't worry, three tails. We'll put you to good use. The use you were always meant for. Asobu tries to struggle free, but there are too many things holding him down. A shield of red chakra forms around Kaitameru, first in the form of a ribsage that extends to form a pair of arms and a skull, which are all then wrapped in a suit of armor. Susano, in its hands, it forms a great axe and a chain, which Kaitameru flicks and sends digging right into Asobu's neck. Asobu can feel his chakra being absorbed from the chains. Adamantine draining chains. Stay still. This'll only take a moment. Kaitameru can't help but say with a hint of glee. Are you ready, Senta? He looks up at Asobu's back. There are two shinobi. One kneeling down and one standing behind him shirtless. Ready? The shirtless man, Senta Uzumaki, shouts out. Then let's begin. In unison, all the Uzumaki gathered around Asobu form the same set of hand signs. Symbols appear under them in a circular pattern that expands to reach the patterns of the ones by the sides. When the symbols meet, they further extend under Asobu and begin to glow when they come in contact with the three-tailed beast. No. Asobu immediately recognizes what this is. A Fuinjutsu. No. His struggles continue to be in vain. The man kneeling on top of Asobu's back begins forming hand signs as well once the Jutsu formulae move closer. Ganjin Seal. The man on top places a hand on Asobu's back and another hand on Senta's chest. As the Jutsu formulae spread over Asobu's entire body and flows into his hand, through his arm, his back, and into Senta's chest. Senta cries out in pain as a massive foreign chakra enters his body, but he grits his teeth and holds strong. For his clan. For their future. Asobu's form shrinks down as his chakra is absorbed into the seal. He knows this is it for him. He desperately tries to go into the mind space he shares with his siblings, with B and Naruto, to warn them. But he doesn't have the strength to even do that. His mind wavers from the loss of chakra, and he can't connect his consciousness anymore. Damn it. Naruto. I'm sorry. After a painfully long time, Isobu is sealed. Senta Uzumaki falls to his knees on the water's surface and tries to keep himself together. His chakra becomes unstable from what he'd just gone through, and just as he's about to drop into the water, Kaitameru flickers by his side and helps up to his feet. You did well, brother. Kaitameru claps Senta on the shoulder. How does it feel? Senta takes a moment to catch his breath. It feels amazing. It has so much chakra. Kaitameru smiles under his mask. When we get back, you and Jun will begin your training right away. He turns back at all the gathered forces and greets them with an approving nod. The Yuzumaki clan he's nurtured all these years, the Amajiri clan who just joined them, Makin and Sikai who now land on the water. How about we all go home? End of chapter 81. Chapter 82. Interlude Part 4. Call to Arms. Hidden Leaf Village Conference Room. Sonata slams both fists on the desk, causing the entire room to quake, and the TVs in front of her to lose signal for a moment. Naruto, sat right beside her, flinches at the sudden outburst. Although her outbursts are common enough where they shouldn't really be unexpected. We can't let this go on any further. She cries out. They've been running circles around for too long. First sending their monsters to attack and now capturing two-tailed beasts. I agree. Ace says. We need to move our plans forward. By plans, you mean the joint union exams? Gara asks. Is it wise to all gather in the same place? Anoki shakes his head. We do need to act. And if worse comes to worst, we'll need more capable Chunin to fight. Mei lowers her gaze. So it's come to this once again, another war. Except this time, the hidden rain will be present to help. Conan states. I wasn't there to take a stand against Madara Ichiha, but this time will be different. Do you think this attack had a specific purpose? Kaitameru asks, trying his best to act innocent. Besides weakening us? Gara answers. We don't know, and that's a big problem. Anoki nods. Their goal is to unleash the great beasts. It would make sense to get rid of the main force capable of opposing them. The tailed beasts. We can't let them get away with any more. They got two. We gotta protect the other four. Yeah. B rhymes from his seat beside his brother. Sonata raises a brow at B's wording. Killer B. Sonata addresses the Jinchuriki. What did you mean by other four? There should be five remaining, right? A furrows his brow. 
Two sealed inside you and Naruto, two captured by the enemy. Yeah, there should be five. Uh, actually, Naruto scratches his head. We don't know where Sai Ken is, either. Sai Ken. The Six Tails? Mei asks. She's missing, too. This time it's A's turn to slam his desk. The signal is lost for a brief moment. What do you mean, you don't know where the Six Tails is? If she's been captured, too, we should know. No, not captured. Naruto explains. We just don't know where she is. We haven't had contact in years. Her gate still stands so we know we ain't captured. B clarifies. Asobu and Kakuo's are all broken and busted. And you can't contact her? Gara asks. Naruto shakes his head. Not unless she wants to be found. Sonata rubs her brow. So that's another thing to worry about for later. We'll deal with it as it comes. For now, we need to make sure the others aren't captured. We'll call Matatabi back. Ace says. I can. Try and speak to Shukaku. Gara says. But I doubt he'll want to. Anoki grumbles. I don't think Son Goku would appreciate it, either. Shibuki lowers his gaze. The Seven Tails. Chimei, I mean, used to be the Hidden Waterfall's tailed beast, but I don't think we have much authority with him. Chimei's probably better at hiding than most so I think he'll be fine. Naruto says. Sonata leans back in her chair. So we need to get the remaining tailed beasts protected and initiate the Chunin exams. Going by the schedule we've made, it's the Hidden Mist's turn to host them. Meitarumi says. I believe that may be a blessing in disguise as we're more difficult to attack than other lands. Should it even come to that? I agree. A nods. We'll keep the location as it was, that much doesn't need to change. Then it's settled. Anoki says in a more authoritative voice. The next Shinobi Union Chunin exams will be held in the Hidden Mist Village. All 12 leaders voiced their agreement. We have our work cut out for us, let's not waste any time. Sonata says before the leaders log off, leaving the Leaf representatives on their own. Granny, Naruto wastes no time. I got something to ask. I feel like I know what but go on. Let me go and check the places where Isobu and Kakuo were captured. Oh, Sonata raises a brow. I thought you were gonna ask. And let Team 9 take part in the Chunin exams. Naruto interrupts her. Sonata chuckles. Yeah, there it is. I get that part, but what do you hope to learn by going to those places? I don't know. Anything. I just. Need to check, you know? I can't sit here and wonder. Fine. I'll send you over. If anyone might learn something, it'd be you and Killer B. But I can't grant your first request just yet. What? Why not? Shikamaru shakes his head as he approaches the desk, having been out of camera view with Kakashi. It's not that simple. Since these Chunin exams are pretty big, we gotta select who goes. Pick the top teams to represent us. Kakashi adds. Although Team 9 has done very well, we still need to review everyone's performance and not be biased. Naruto crosses his arms. All right then. Don't worry, we'll call you when we've decided. Then I'll go get ready to leave. I'll just have Sasuke take me there. Naruto runs out of the room in record speed. Sonata can only chuckle as he bolts. Hidden Mountain Village Sikai Miyashi sits cross-legged on a railing, high up in the village that's high up in the mountain. From his view, he can see the village spreading further below him, built in layers into the mountainside. To think I'd end up here. He laments. After so many years of hating the very idea, why does it feel like this is what I should have been doing the whole time? Hidden Mountain, Yuzumaki, Miyashi. His thoughts are interrupted when someone else leans on the railing, causing it to shift ever so slightly. Sikai looks to the side, to see the man who brought him here. How are you faring, Sikai? Kaitamaru asks. Still coming to terms with it all. Your meeting ended? Sikai asks. It did. And as expected, the Shinobi Union is mobilizing in full force. The Chunin exams are nearing and we have to prepare accordingly. That also means you'll have to go to one of our secret locations. There's too much traffic here in the Hidden Mountain Village, you could be recognized. Sikai nods. I'm a bounty hunter, I'm familiar with laying low. Kaitamaru smiles and clasps his shoulder, lightly. As a way to display camaraderie and kinship, I'm aware you're capable. Still, I can't help but advise caution. You leave with Makan and the Amajiri he brought with him. I'll send someone to show you the way. Just a little bit longer and I promise it'll all fall into place. Kaitamaru lets go of Sikai's shoulder and pats it, before walking away. As Sikai prepares to leave, Kaitamaru rounds the corner to be met by another new arrival to his army. Makan Hoyoku who's standing against a wall with his arms crossed. Ah, Makan, just the man I was looking for. I'll send an escort to. 
Kaitamaru begins explaining when he's suddenly cut off. What did you do to him? Makan stares him down with a stern gaze. Kaitamaru smirks. Whatever do you mean? Don't play dumb with me, Yuzumaki. Makan straightens himself and walks up close to Kaitamaru, standing just a bit shorter than the village leader. He's trying to kill us and all of a sudden, at the snap of a finger, he's on your side and ready to abandon everything for your cause. I know why I'm here, but him? What the fuck did you do? Kaitamaru chuckles. Oh, Makan, I assure you there's nothing to worry about. I already told you. I merely opened his mind and showed him where his anger should be directed. He hates the hidden villages, and I intend to bring the hidden villages to their knees. We have a lot in common. He leans in closer and grins. Or are you worried I'll do the same to you? Makan subconsciously takes a step back. If you could, you would've. Or I simply had no need to. Kaitamaru walks past Makan and continues on his way. I'll send an escort to lead you to the hideout. Get your men ready. Sure. The Nine Gates. Within the confines of the shared mind space, Naruto looks at the destroyed three and five gates. All the remaining tailed beasts stand under their gate in council, save for Sai Ken. Her six gate stands empty but still standing. The main purpose for Naruto and B calling this meeting is to catch up the others on what the union wants to do, to provide shelter and protection to the tailed beasts so this doesn't happen again. We have to keep all of you safe. Naruto says. Shukaku laughs. You expect us to trust humans again? Just because we are not trying to kill each other doesn't mean we're friends, you know. Think this through, Shukaku. Gyuki cautions. They took out Asobu and Kakuo before we could even realize. This isn't the time to be prideful. He's right. Matatabi chimes in. If there was ever a time for us to unite, it's now. Of course you two think so, you got soft around your Jinchuriki. Son Goku, you're with me on this, right? We're better off on our own. Son Goku looks over his siblings before lowering his gaze to Naruto who stands expectantly, waiting for an answer. He notes the genuine concern in the boy's eyes and in his voice, the same concern he saw while Abito had captured them all. He knows Naruto believes this to be the best choice, but he's still not entirely certain himself. I'm not so sure. Son Goku shakes his head. What? Shukaku utters in surprise. Not you, too. You're seeing this, too, aren't you? Son Goku shouts. Asobu and Kakuo are strong, and yet they were kill. We don't know that. Matatabi interrupts him. We don't know what fate's befallen them. Be that as it may, they're gone. Son Goku continues, black plumes puffing out his nostrils as he huffs. And we don't even know where Saiken is. This clearly isn't a threat we can face divided. Maybe they got Saiken, too, Chimei says. Kurama shakes his head and finally says something after remaining silent. Her gate isn't ruined, so she's probably just out of reach. Gone to places unknown. The problem is we don't actually know what these gates mean. We never had them before, they're only here now because of Naruto's influence. Gyuki says. It could mean that Saiken was captured while Asobu and Kakuo were killed. Or the opposite. All the more reason to not risk our own lives to find out. Son Goku says. I'm going to speak to the Tsuchi Kage as you requested, Naruto, and we'll face this threat together. Thanks. I know there's still a lot of bad blood. Blood can always be washed out. B says. I'll stay out. Chimei says. I'm difficult to find if I wanna be. I can keep an eye out on the outside if we need it. You'd be risking your own safety. Gyuki says. That's fine. This is what I'm good at. I'll keep you updated if I sense anything. So, Shukaku? Matatabi turns to him. Is your mind still unchanged? Damn right it is. You can all go and hide away with the shinobi, I'm staying where I am. Gyuki sighs. Please, just. Be careful. Kurama chuckles. We know that's not happening. What's that supposed to mean? Kurama just chuckles again in response. Then. This is how it is? Naruto asks. I don't know if this is much better, but. It'll be fine. Kurama reassures him. With that, they all disperse and return their consciousness to the real world. Land of Wind As Shukaku leaves the mind space, he finds himself in a dark and rather tight cave. Tight for a tailed beast, that is, for a regular person it'd be extremely spacious. It's a good hiding place for while he's communicating with the others, especially since he made it himself so it's more intricately connected to him. Any more violent disruptions he would have sensed and snapped back in order to fight. Right now what he's feeling isn't anyone attacking, but there's a great disturbance in the sand, in a way that's very familiar. It's as if he himself is manipulating the sand on the surface outside which can really mean only one thing. 
Shukaku decides to be a bit mischievous and violently jump out of the sand dome he'd built for himself underground. As he does, he's met by a very familiar, annoyingly familiar, figure of a young man floating in the air on a cloud of sand. Gara looks at the massive form in front of him, not even flinching at the sudden eruption of sand. Shukaku. He addresses the tailed beast while gathering back the sand he'd sent to the ground for scouting. Gara. Shukaku grumbles. The two stay in awkward silence for a moment longer, neither continuing the conversation, or at least not knowing how to. Gara seems completely unfazed by the silence, he always was a weird one. Shukaku finally gives in and grumbles. Why are you here? To ask you to come to the hidden sand with me. Pa. Forget it. I'll tell you what I told Naruto and B. I'm not trusting any of you for a second. This isn't the time for senseless pride. Gara argues. The three tails and five tails were captured, what makes you believe you stand a better chance all on your own? Shukaku bears his fangs. Their names are Isobu and Kakuo, and I can do a whole lot more without being slowed down by you. I spent years being slowed down. No more. An abrupt sandstorm washes over the area just as Shukaku finishes speaking. Gara looks away and shields his eyes. His sand gathers around his legs as the winds become more violent, threatening to blow him off. When the dust settles, Gara looks around but sees not a trace of Shukaku. So stubborn. Gara sighs in defeat. Just be careful, Shukaku. He turns his floating sand cloud around and heads back from whence he came. Yuzumaki Household As Naruto snaps back to his body, in his bedroom, he stands up from his meditative position and continues what he was doing before. Preparing to leave for foreign lands. In truth, he really only needs to pack the essentials as if he needs anything more specialized, he won't know until he gets there. A very familiar voice calls out to him from the floor below. Remind me again why I'm taking you? Because it's faster. Naruto replies. Downstairs, Sasuke is comfortably sat on the living room couch, waiting for Naruto to get ready so he can act as a transport service once again. These truly have been busy days for him, and he's considering taking extended vacations. Hinata places a cup of tea on the table in front of him. Thank you for your hard work. I know it hasn't been easy for you. It's unavoidable. He sighs. It expedited the process and helped people in need. You certainly made my job easier as a shinobi union representative. As Sasuke is occupied talking to Hinata, he's interrupted by a tugging at his shirt. He turns around to see a small head of blonde hair pulling his sleeve. Sasi. Sasi. Hiroto repeats. It's Sasuke. Sasuke. He corrects the toddler. Sasi. Hiroto calls out in excitement that he finally got Uncle Sasi's attention. Hinata walks around the table to pick up the wandering toddler. Now, now, it's rude to interrupt guests. Hiroto clings to her and snuggles against her chest. He's grown so much. I think Kami might be bigger, though. Hinata giggles. Sasuke chuckles. She's fairly big, yes. All right, I'm done. Naruto jumps down from several flights of stairs. Let's go. Wait. Katori runs out after him. Let me come with you. Katori. Naruto walks up to her and kneels down in front of her. This is something I have to do. You have something else you should be doing. But I want to help. She protests. And if I find something and you can help with it, I'll come get you. Right now, the thing you can do best is keep training, keep growing stronger. All right? Katori pouts and grumbles for a moment, but finally gives in. Fine, that a girl. Naruto kisses her on the top of the head. When I get back, show me how much better you've gotten with your jutsu. He stands up and throws his backpack over his coat. All right, Sasuke, let's go. Sasuke takes the cup of tea and gulps it down. Can't be rude to the host, after all. At least not to Hinata. Naruto walks over and hugs Hinata and gives Hiroto a kiss on the forehead as the boys call out for Dada. I'll be home soon, little guy. I hope you find something. Hinata says. Yeah, I hope so, too. Naruto gives a strained smile. Sasuke turns to face a more spacious area in their living room, to have enough room to open a portal. When he tries to, however, a familiar sharp pain hits him like a brick to the face. He fights through it and tries not to show any sign that something's wrong. Despite the migraine he's getting and the blood he can feel trickling down from his left eye. When the portal opens, Naruto runs directly into it. See you soon. He calls out to his family. Sasuke walks in and uses the brief time he has to wipe the blood off. North Great Barrier Sea The first location they visit is around where Isobu is believed to have been caught. 
The only real leads they have of the fight are reports from local fishers who claim to have seen the giant battle from the far, far distance. Right now, investigating the water surface, the underground, and the nearby island formations are Shinobi and Anbu from different nations. Currently, a hidden mist Anbu is catching up Naruto and Sasuke with what information she and the others have managed to gather. A scuffle between mainly two large turtles sent waves crashing all the way to the nearby town, but the thing that catches Naruto's attention is mention of one other specific large beast. A flaming bird? Naruto questions the Anbu that reported their findings. Are you sure? The woman nods. Yes, sir. The locals said they saw a giant firebird in the skies in this area when the Three Tails was captured. Naruto grits his teeth. So, that guy really was working with them? They couldn't get the Hidden Dreams wolf, so they set their sights elsewhere. Sasuke says. The Anbu continues her report. If the firebird truly does belong to Makin Hoyoku, then our other reports may be connected, as well. What other reports? She points to the northwest. There's a resort town about a day inland, Tashiwaka town. The forest just outside was burned to a crisp by an unknown source. Judging by the sheer scale of the destruction and the way the trees have been burned, we believe it to have been the work of Makin Hoyoku, as well. I take it you're going to want to go there, as well? Sasuke asks a fairly obvious question. Of course we are. But first. Naruto sits down cross-legged on the water and begins meditating. After remaining in silence for a few moments, the Anbu turns to Sasuke. Um, what's he doing? You'll see. It usually takes a while. After a minute of silence, Naruto stands up and looks around the area. When he turns his head, the Anbu sees the very distinct change in his eye color, going from a blue you could get washed away in, to a piercing yellow. There's more than usual. He says. The Anbu tilts her head. More of what? Natural energy, I presume? Sasuke surmises. Wouldn't it get carried away by the waves? We're in a sea, after all. Naruto shakes his head. It doesn't really work like that. Natural energy kinda stays where it is for the most part, if that makes sense. It doesn't really travel like something physical, although it gets weaker without a powerful source. And that's happening here? Yeah. Whatever happened, there was definite natural energy used. Naruto dives deeper down into the sea, where he can sense some more shinobi investigating. He recognizes an unnaturally large clump of coral that would be a Sobu's creation, and recognizes a massive crater on the seabed caused from the fight, most likely a Sobu fighting back with a tailed beast bomb. He looks around but unfortunately the only thing he can actually do is guess as to what may have happened. He finds no evidence that would lead them closer to finding out where the attackers came from and where they went. When he comes back up to the surface, he approaches Sasuke who'd been asking around on his own what the Anbu had found. Nothing? Naruto clenches his fist. It was a small chance we'd actually find anything to begin with. Sasuke shrugs. Shall we go? Yeah. Naruto begins walking in the direction pointed before, to Tashiwaka Town, when Sasuke stops him. I can take us directly to Tashiwaka Town. I've been there. Naruto raises a brow. Why do you know the location of this resort town? I've been there. Their onsen are some of the best in the land. Sasuke answers without looking back, but even still, he can feel Naruto staring at the back of his head. He sighs and turns around. What? You've actually been to an onsen? Naruto chuckles. What, you mean like on a mission or something? No, to relax. Sasuke, you don't know how to relax. Just shut up and let's go. Sasuke sighs and opens a new portal. This time the pain isn't as sharp as before although it's still present. He once again fights through it without saying a word. Outskirts of Tashiwaka Town As the capture of the tailed beasts was deemed top priority, most of the forces were sent to the locations they were last seen to try and track where their captors may have fled to. That's why the group gathered by Tashiwaka is smaller compared to what was sent to Tashiwaka. As soon as Naruto and Sasuke step out of the portal, they can't help but recoil at the destruction. Everything around them is burned to cinders, leaving the area a barren field of ash and charcoal. The only hints of what this forest may have once looked like lie in the far distance where the trees yet remain green. What happened here? Naruto whispers to himself. A hidden mist Anbu approaches them when they arrive. Best we can surmise, a whole lot of fire. You must be good at your job. Sasuke says in his usual dry tone. Do you know what happened exactly? Naruto asks. From what we've pieced together, whatever happened here happened about a day before the Three Tails was attacked. Judging by the reports we've gotten about Makin Hoyoku, we believe this to be his doing. Why would he burn down a forest? Sasuke asks. That, we still don't know. 
the man matching his description was seen in a local onsen, but then vanished into thin air. Much of the area has been doused in water, which as far as we're aware he's unable to use, so we believe he fought a water-style user here. Naruto scans the area, focusing on where the Anbu motion that water is present. The presence is much stronger here and definitely feels familiar. There's natural energy here. It feels similar to what I sensed at sea. He kneels down and presses his hand against a softer ground, still affected by whatever water had covered it. That doesn't make sense. Sasuke says. If Makinhoyoku fought against a water-style user, then why would they then go fight the three tails together? Or did their fight just carry over? Naruto scratches his head. Was this water-style user trying to stop Makin from capturing Isobu? The Anbu takes out a scroll and scribbles down a few things as Naruto and Sasuke talk. Either way, you've helped us glean more insight into the situation. Whatever the case is, we know what we should be looking for. Thank you. That's why I wanted to come. Naruto nods. Sir. A voice calls out from the end of the clearing, drawing the attention of Naruto, Sasuke, and the Anbu speaking to them. Another member of Anbu walks out into the clearing, ushering a man to walk in front of him with the point of his sword. You don't have to actually stab me. The man complains. He's a tall, bulky man with short red hair, dressed in clothing that doesn't quite identify him as belonging to any particular village. He doesn't even have a forehead protector on him. But the most peculiar thing about him is that on his hip he carries an empty hilt. No blade in sight, just a plain sword hilt. We found an intruder lurking about. The Anmu reports. Like I said, I was just looking for my. The man stops when he looks around the area and spots a familiar face. Oh, if it isn't Naruto. Hey, could you tell this guy to cut it out? Naruto squints his eyes for a moment, trying to identify the man. Boy, don't tell me you've forgotten. The man narrows his eyes. Ah. You're. Isa. Naruto finally remembers. Isa Miyashi. You can let him go, I know him. He's not an enemy. He says to the Mist Anbu. The two Anbu shrug at each other and choose to trust that the world savior knows what he's talking about. Naruto walks over to Isa. What are you doing here? Looking for my brother, actually. I don't suppose you've seen him. Sekai? No, I haven't. Naruto shakes his head. Sasuke steps forward, as well, choosing to stop just behind Naruto. And why would your brother be here? He was hunting a high-profile bounty posted by your shinobi union, Makin Hoyoku from the Hidden Dream Village. Far as I know, Sekai tracked him to the area and came to capture him. Naruto furrows a brow. Sekai was tracking Makin? Did he actually find him? I don't know. Isa shakes his head. I hadn't heard from him in a while, so I followed his leads to here, but all I found was a burned forest and Union Anbu lurking around. Naruto and Sasuke share a confused look, as the possible involvement of yet a third person only serves to complicate things. We think Makin Hoyoku fought here, but we think he fought a water-style user. I don't suppose your brother knows water-style jutsu? Sasuke asks. Not even a drop, no. We're fire-style users. Isa answers. Oh, yeah, Sasuke, they're the ones I told you about. With the really hot fire style. It might be just as hot as your Amaterasu. Naruto says. Sasuke raises a brow at the statement and takes a moment to think, his mind churning with ideas. What, are you jealous because I said that? No, you dolt, I'm thinking. Unlike you. Sasuke snaps at him before turning to Isa. If your flames are as hot as mine, then they should leave a unique trace that no other fire leaves behind. Can you identify if any of the damage here is caused by your flames? Oh, yeah, a bunch of it is. I already scouted the area a bit ago. Isa answers. Sekai definitely fought here. So. That complicates things. Sasuke sighs. Naruto turns to the Anbu. Hey, have people in town seen Sekai? Long red hair, wrapped in bandages Kindagai? We could ask around for him. I doubt anyone's seen him. Isa says. He knows how to keep a low profile, especially with a mark like this Makin guy. Well, if we do find out where he is, we'll tell you. Naruto says. Thanks. It's been good to see you doing well, Naruto. Isa smiles. You, too. I hope whatever happened here, Sekai got out fine. Knowing him, I'm sure he did. Isa looks around. If it's fine with you lot, I'll take my leave. We have some safe spots we go to, Sekai might be there somewhere. Until next time, Naruto Uzumaki. He turns around and heads out of the clearing, with a wave as he walks away. See you. Naruto waves back. With the new information presented to them, Naruto and Sasuke give the Anbu full information of what they know and have found out and head to the next location soon after. Unfortunately, the area they believe Kakuo disappeared from isn't as easily zoned in on. 
with Asobu, there were nearby fishermen who saw the commotion, but Kakuo was in a desert with no one around to witness anything. The area they believed the fight took place doesn't offer any insight, like the previous locations did. With a hint of dejection, Naruto and Sasuke go back home after a solid day of traveling to and from. Uzumaki Clan District Naruto has to walk back home, seeing as Sasuke dropped them off at the Hakage's office to report what they found out and what they told the hidden Mist Anbu. From there on, they walk their separate ways, each going home. He uses his opportunity to gather his thoughts after a day of worrying and talking. It's relaxing to just walk. These Uzumaki clan members that seems to appear and disappear on a whim. They keep getting their way over and over, and by the time anyone realizes what they've done, they're gone. Naruto stops in front of the main gates of the Uzumaki clan district and takes a long pointed look at the clan Mon. A clan. Something he'd never really put any thought in as a kid, he just accepted he was on his own. Yet these strangers trusted him enough to follow his lead and become Hidden Leaf citizens and shinobi. He has to do right by them and fix what's going on. Members of his clan, of his mother's clan, are threatening the world as they know it. If he can't do this as a clan head, then what would he do as Hakage? Naruto stands in place for a while longer, thinking over everything which is counterproductive to his original idea of not worrying and just taking a nice stroll. Naruto, a deep voice calls out to him. He turns around to see two of his clan's elders, walking to the gate with reddened cheeks and reddened noses and in a seemingly pleasant mood. Uncle Yezu, Gramps Awaji. You've returned. Awaji steps forward and tries to hold his wobbly self straight. Did you find anything? A bit. Naruto looks them both over. I don't think you're in a position to hear it, though. He chuckles. Ha. Yezu bellows. I can drink your weight in sake and still be in tip-top shape. He hiccups. Sure. Naruto claps his back and begins leading them. You two geezers have fun? Who's a geezer? Awaji grumbles. Wasn't the intent to have fun, but we kinda went overboard, huh? Yezu says. We had a lot of catching up to do. Awaji answers. A lot of things to go over. From the past and present. He adds with a dejected voice before turning to Naruto. We have to stop them. We can't let them tarnish our name. Naruto pats the elder on the back. Don't worry, Gramps. We got everyone on it. I just hope that's enough. Awaji sighs. If only I wasn't this darn old. Your age is what's allowed you to gather everyone in one place. Naruto reassures him. It's a blessing. It's a miracle is what it is, that you're this old. Yezu chuckles. Stop your worrying, elder. It won't do us much. The three of them walk along the district streets in comfortable silence until they reach Awaji's home. As soon as they reach the front door, it slings open to reveal Awaji's daughter, Minami Uzumaki, rushes out. There you are, father, we were getting worried. She says, taking him by the arm. Thank you for escorting him back. She bows her head to Naruto. It's fine. He chuckles. Make sure he gets rest. I will. Good evening to you too. With that, Naruto and Yezu walk not that much farther to their own homes. The district itself isn't that big to begin with, since the Uzumaki clan isn't that big, so their houses are a pretty short distance away. Do you want to come inside? Naruto offers as they come to his home first. Yezu shakes his head. Nah, it's fine. I don't want to be drunk around Hiroto. I thought you were in tip-top shape? Naruto laughs. Tip-top drunk shape. Yezu clarifies and heads off to the neighboring house. I'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Naruto picks up his pace in these last few steps to finally get home. As soon as he opens the door, he's greeted by the sounds of an unusually busy home, or at least busier than normal. The pleasant sounds of laughter and a toddler's cheering fill the home. I'm home. Naruto calls out as he takes off his shoes. Welcome home. Hinata makes her way out to the entryway to greet him. How did it go? About as well as I thought. I'll tell you all about it. He motions to the living room. We have guests? We do. Hinata says and leads him inside. In the living room, Naruto first sees Konohimaru lounging on the couch while in front, Hiroto is chasing his auntie Hanabi, who very slowly tries to run from the toddler. Hanabi slows her pace to a crawl, allowing the barely walking Hiroto to grab her leg. Ah, you caught me. Hanabi feigns defeat and picks up the giggling Hiroto. You're so fast, I couldn't escape. She kisses his nose, eliciting a giggle. Konohimaru, Hanabi. Naruto greets them. It's good to see you. What brings you two here? He and Hinata both sit down on the armchairs opposite the couch. We just haven't been in a while, you know? Konohimaru answers. Not much of a chance to hang out. Hanabi presses her nose against Hiroto and rubs it. 
and I wanted to see the cutest and sweetest little boy. You both know you're welcome at any time, no matter the reason. Hinata says with a smile. Hanabi walks over and sits by Konohamaru's side, while Hiroto's snuggled by her chest. She leans on Konohamaru's shoulder and smiles. We know, but you've had a lot of things on your mind, right? All the more reason we need the distraction. Naruto laughs. Hey, bro, are things really that serious? Konohamaru asks. I've talked with mom and dad about it and it's not looking good. Father has the entire Hyuga clan on high alert as well. I've heard. Hinata says with a hint of worry. Naruto shakes his head. No, it's not looking good. The village heads are starting up the Chunin exams to gather together and finally figure out what to do about all this. The Chunin exams, huh? Konohamaru leans back. That brings me back. Yeah, the good old times when I kicked your butt. Hanabi giggles. That's not what happened at all. Konohamaru protests. Sure thing, sweetie. Hanabi laughs and leans forward to look at Naruto. Is Team 9 going to take part? If we're picked for it. Apparently they're carefully selecting who's gonna be allowed to go. Still waiting for an answer. Team 9's strong. Konohamaru says. You and Team 5 are apparently some of the best genin we've had in a while, so they're definitely a shoe in Speaking of, where is Katori? Naruto looks around. She's out training with Yakamaru and Shoto. Hinata explains. They've been at it since you and Sasuke left. Naruto sighs. I think they probably realize things are getting serious. They're smart, those kids. Hey, bro, Konohamaru says with a less jovial tone than he's been speaking with so far. You know whatever happens, I'm sticking by your side. If worse comes to worst, this time I'll fight with you. We both will. Hanabi says. Naruto gives a strained smile and pounds him on the chest. I know. I hope it doesn't come to it, though. Hinata notes Hiroto's nodding little head and fluttering eyes, the young boy desperately trying to fight off sleep, but it's very much a losing game. She walks over to Hanabi and brushes her son's hair. Let's put him to sleep. Sure thing. Hanabi carefully stands up not to jostle Hiroto too much, and the two head upstairs to his bedroom. How about we play some cards when they come back? Naruto suggests. That'd be nice. We don't get a lot of chances to just relax. No, no, we don't. End of chapter 82